Steve Means program, all the above, strategies for tackling climate change. I'm Claire Noble, the Director of Programming for the Vail Symposium. On behalf of Chris Sable, our Executive Director, Dale Mosier, our Board Chairman, and the entire Vail Symposium Board, welcome. We're celebrating 50 years of convening locally and thinking globally. A few items to be aware of before we get started. For the first few segments, we're going to use the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen to submit questions for tonight's speakers. And you can type those in there at any time. We'll try to get to as many as time permits. Tonight's program will run until 7.45. It's being recorded, and you'll be able to find that recording at veilsymposium.org. I'd like to take just a moment to thank some of the organizations and individuals who've helped make tonight's program possible. Our sponsors include the Town of Vail, Vail Resorts Epic Promise, the Antlers at Vail, and the Vail Daily. Our virtual programs are sponsored by Alpine Bank. Cindy Ingalls and Leela and Walt Misher have underwritten the summer season. Underwriters for the Environmental Awareness Series are Holly and Buck Elliott. And tonight's program was underwritten by Betsy and Jesse Fink and Laura Tamperi. The Vail Symposium is also supported by a generous grant from the Frechette Family Foundation. Thank you to all of our donors. We couldn't do it without you. Our next program will be on Tuesday, September 28th, when we meet in person for fan favorite Timothy Standring of the Denver Art Museum with a preview of the museum's upcoming exhibit, Whistler to Cassatt. We'll be at the Edwards Interfaith Chapel. Again, that's Tuesday, September 28th at 6 p.m. Tonight, we turn our attention to strategies for tackling climate change. And some of our allies in this fight are furry, others are policies, but the first one we're going to discuss is usually green and slippery. We begin with seaweed. Dr. Nicole Price is a senior research scientist at the Bigelow Laboratory for Ocean Sciences. She is a benthic marine ecologist with an interest in how global change phenomena like ocean acidification and warming can alter bottom dwelling species interactions, community dynamics, and ecosystem function in shallow coastal regimes. Her work focuses primarily on the ecophysiology of seaweeds and calcifying invertebrates and their current and future role in dissolved inorganic carbon and nutrient cycling. She holds a BA in biology and math from Connecticut College and an MS in applied statistics and probability from the University of California at Santa Barbara and a PhD in ecology, evolution and marine biology also from the University of California at Santa Barbara. Welcome, Dr. Price. Thank you, Claire. Um, I'll go ahead and share my screen now. Thank you very much, Claire, for and the organizers for inviting me to speak this evening. As you said, I'm Nicole Price, a senior research scientist at the Bigelow Lab for Ocean Sciences, and we're in East Booth Bay, Maine. I also direct our Center for Seafood Solutions that matches our cutting edge science with research needs identified by environmental groups, policymakers, and industry. Since its inception five years ago in 2016, we've been asked by every type of stakeholder whether or not farmed seaweed can be used to mitigate climate change and have been working on all aspects of this potential solution. Today, I will be reviewing what we know to date about carbon dioxide removal and storage by reforesting the ocean with cultivated seaweeds. And I will identify some key knowledge gaps to address to evaluate the risks and opportunities to use seaweed as an ocean negative emissions technology. My talk is structured to answer a series of six prodding questions. And the first is, why do we care about carbon? Carbon is the fourth most abundant element on our planet after hydrogen, helium, and oxygen. Carbon in our atmosphere was essential to life, even forming on this planet in the first place. Earth has this atmospheric blanket that allows solar radiation to enter and then retain some of that heat. This is known as the greenhouse effect. Man didn't cause it and Earth would be a cold dead rock without it. But unfortunately, mankind is altering our atmosphere. Humanity is releasing almost 36 billion tons of carbon each year. This is thickening the atmospheric blanket and warming up our atmosphere and acidifying our oceans. So what 
do we do about it? In addition to reducing greenhouse gas emissions, we need to remove legacy carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. We are all familiar with the idea of trees capturing carbon dioxide to grow and storing it long-term in their roots and in the soil. The sequestration process can remove that legacy carbon. But what about underwater forests and marine systems? This concept of blue carbon didn't start with seaweeds. It started with the true marine plants. So second question, what is blue carbon? The idea of blue carbon or carbon becoming buried in marine sediments at sufficient time scales to be considered truly sequestered is far more established for true marine plants like mangroves and seagrasses and salt marshes. These coastal wetland plants have roots and rhizomes that bury carbon in the marine sediment below them where it can stay for centuries or even millennia. The past decade has seen a flurry of research tailored to figure out exactly how much blue carbon is stored and how fast. So what have we learned about what blue carbon can do? The largest store of that carbon is in the first meter of marine sediments. And marshes and mangroves store more carbon than tropical forests. My mouse has stopped working. Apologies. There it goes. Wetland plants are very productive, so they take up carbon dioxide faster than forests. The seagrass, the mangroves, the salt marsh are all quicker at taking up carbon dioxide than tropical forests. And carbon can stay in marine sediments for centuries. These coastal habitats are small but mighty. Although they cover less than 1% of the ocean, they store over 50% of the seabed's rich carbon reserves. This carbon sequestration process is happening on coastlines all over the world. Mangroves, salt marshes, and seagrasses have an impressive global distribution. But kelp, a very particular kind of subtitled brown forest growing seaweed, also has a broad distribution and these marine photosynthesizers grow far faster than seagrasses, marshes, or mangroves. They can get to full size within a matter of months. Given their relative abundance and growth rate, why have seaweeds long been left out of the blue carbon discussion? Next question, can seaweed sequester carbon? Part of the reason that seaweeds are often overlooked is because their natural life history seemingly suggests they don't contribute to carbon storage in marine sediments. They, generally speaking, have short lifespans, just a year or two, and while seaweeds conduct photosynthesis in their fronds and blades that are like their leaves, their stipes and holdfasts, or their stems and root-like structures, are used only to attach the alga to rocky surfaces on the seafloor. They do not directly transfer carbon into marine sediments during growth. Whether the fronds are eventually consumed by fish or other herbivores or by microbial films as they senesce and die off, it has been generally assumed that the fixed carbon is released back to the atmosphere on rather short timescales, like weeks to years. But a missing piece of the puzzle is an understanding of the fate of broken off pieces of the seaweed called detritus. We are only beginning to learn how far and fast seaweed fragments or detritus travel and what becomes of those fragments when they sink to the sea floor. It turns out that using novel DNA fingerprinting strategies and tried and true stable isotope approaches, we can find evidence of seaweed pieces getting delivered offshore up to 5,000 kilometers and down 200 meters deep. Scientists estimate that anywhere from three to 26% of the carbon initially captured by seaweeds eventually breaks off and becomes sequestered in the marine sediments. At a global scale, this represents roughly 173 teragrams of carbon sequestered per year, which is similar to the sequestration rate of forests in North America. As of now, these sequestration rates are rarely included in any ge geopolitical carbon budget other than in China and Korea. The role of seaweeds in blue carbon strategies remains controversial, despite seaweed habitats being the most extended, productive, and diverse on the planet. 
the criteria for inclusion in the discussion hinges upon how extensive and actionable ocean afforestation or seaweed farming will be and development of verified standards that carbon removal is real, measurable, permanent, unique, and additional. Seaweed farming represents a clear pathway to additionality and uniqueness. So why and how does one farm seaweed? In practice, individual seaweed farms come in all shapes and sizes. The most common is longline farming in shallow coastal zones using an anchoring and float system. Although the practice is centuries old, it's very nascent in the US and the first commercial kelp farm was established in Casco Bay near Portland, Maine in 2009. Seaweed farming is appealing because it can be done with very low tech approaches and thus requires relatively little capital or operating expenses to get started as compared to other aquaculture ventures. Further, the first crop is harvestable after just six months. As of now, only 10 species are intensively cultivated worldwide, but there are hundreds of species wild harvested for various products. Seaweed farming yields a nutritional, sustainable product in an increasingly food insecure world. It is also perhaps the only carbon capture option that can generate revenue for small businesses in rural working waterfront communities. Interest in seaweed farming has been growing rapidly and the annual landings are on an exponential growth curve, growth curve worldwide, regardless whether historical estimates or recent estimates of sector growth on the past few years are used, global seaweed production is set to surpass potato production in the coming decades. With this much seaweed produced, an estimate and an estimated 11% sequestration due to burial of naturally sloughed detritus or seaweed fragments, roughly 4.5 teragrams of carbon per year could be sequestered on top of the natural processes from wild seaweed beds. And this is the additionality that we're looking for. So how do we quantify carbon sequestration from seaweed farms? I, together with colleagues from Maine, and part of a worldwide research program called the Oceans 2050 Project. This is a global effort to determine carbon storage rates beneath seaweed farms. There are 22 participating seaweed farms stretched across 12 countries. These farms range in size and in age and differ by which seaweeds they grow and harvest. This 15 month study will quantify carbon sequestration by seaweed and sediment across the participating farms on five continents, creating new market incentives for seaweed aquaculture. The Oceans 2050 study led by Carlos Duarte aims to address one of the first knowledge gaps I list here. What are seaweed species specific carbon depos deposition rates directly under a farm? But there are there remain major knowledge gaps to determining the contribution, risks, and opportunities that seaweed farming represents as a legacy atmospheric removal technology. And they include, can we accurately predict and verify where the detritus or seaweed fragments go and how long that carbon stays buried? Should we sink entire seaweed farms to maximize this carbon sequestration benefit? Or are there other uses for farm seaweeds that help us avoid carbon emissions elsewhere, in food supply chains, for instance. Are ecological and social carrying capacities sufficient for farmed seaweed? Can seaweeds adapt to warming through husbandry practices that are common for land-based agriculture, but only very recently introduced to seaweed aquaculture? What is the cradle to grave carbon footprint of seaweed production? I hope you leave this talk excited about the potential for farm seaweed to offer a multi-pronged solution to many problems, but there's much work to be done to safely harness this power and understand its full true impact. The ocean is vital to the health of our planet and the success of our society. Our oxygen and food, technologies and medicines, careers and economy, the ocean shapes all life and science can unlock its full potential. At Bigelow Lab for Ocean Sciences in East Booth Bay, we advance bold science for our blue planet. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Dr. Price. And I just want to remind our audience that you can use the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen to submit questions this evening for Dr. Price. And I'll just get started. And um, my coloring is a little odd, and I'm not right, quite sure why that is. But uh, hopefully, you can hear me and see me just fine. Um, so one of the things we're hearing about seaweed is that it can also be added to animal feed. And that animal feed then causes a reduction in livestock production of methane gases. So is it possible that the seaweed that's grown for that itself absorbs carbon dioxide, and then when it's fed to the livestock, it prevents them from producing as much methane gas as they would typically produce? Yeah, there's definitely some exciting research about certain red species of seaweed coming out of the tropics that can reduce enteric methane emissions or the methane burps really from cows as they ferment their uh, feed in the rumen. And this tropical red seaweed can reduce those burps by up to 80% in some live animal studies. So it's pretty exciting. That particular species of seaweed is going to be difficult to scale up to meet global demand. So there's a group of us on the East Coast working hard at looking at some of the seaweed species that are already cultivated at scale that could be entered into that supply chain. From the animal producer's perspective, um, reducing methane alone is not enough of an enticement to include the seaweed in the diet. There needs to be other benefits like improvements to milk quality or milk yield in the dairy sector. Um, and the same would be true in the beef sector in terms of, of meat production. It also needs to be an affordable product to enter that supply chain. So there's a lot of work trying to figure out um, the best ways to process that seaweed in order to get it into the feed supply chain and have it have multiple benefits at the same time. So uh, I'm a little seaweed um, ignorant. I thought seaweed was kind of seaweed. How many types of seaweed are we talking about? <laughs> Well, there's at least 250 species of seaweed on the coast of Maine alone, um, but there's probably thousands out there. They're generally categorized into three big groups. There's a red group, a green group, and a brown group. Mm -hmm. It's the brown seaweeds and the very large versions of those that create the underwater forests or the kelp forests that we're used to. Um, but with that level of diversity across those seaweeds, there's just really untapped potential for not only feed, but pharmaceuticals, nutraceuticals, all sorts of applications of, of seaweeds. So Leslie has a question about how global warming is, and rising seas are affecting seaweed growth and or carbon sequestration. And I will say the BBC just had a segment on seaweed growing operations in Zanzibar and how they've had to move the seaweed cultivation out farther because the water close in is getting too warm. So are, is, is warming water one of the problems that might be affecting seaweed as well as uh, rising ocean levels? Yeah, I would say that I would, I would speculate that the warming temperature might be even more of a problem than the rising seawater levels. And there's a nice study that came out uh, maybe back in 2011 out of Australia, Western Australia, where they used um, seaweed pressings that went back hundreds of years or a hundred years at least to figure out which species were present along the coastline back before warming had really become a problem as compared to now. And there's strong evidence of the seaweeds migrating polewards away from the warmer water at the equator and their species ranges shifting farther south. And we see this in a lot of marine species, not just seaweeds. So there definitely is a concern about population level impacts from warming. Um, at least for the temperate zones where kelp is farmed, the season for growing the kelp is through the winter months and it's harvested generally in the spring before the summer months hit. So in terms of yield and production, crop production from a particular farm, it hasn't really impacted that yet. However, our ability to find the brood stock for a particular species is getting harder and harder as their populations are migrating north or disappearing entirely. And so Bigelow also has a separate 
program um, about cryopreservation or deep freezing. Think um, Austin Powers yeah. you know, getting frozen. Yeah. We could do that with seaweed uh, spores and then be able to regenerate them and, and also you know, maintain a repository for diversity as we move forward into an uncertain future. So last year, the Vail Symposium aired a documentary, uh, They Say It Can't Be Done. And one of the segments focused on a seaweed farm in California that was growing at the same time mussels. That <laughs> it, it seemed like the, the seaweed and the mussels um, had a great relationship there. And I'm just wondering if uh, seaweed has a particular relationship with filter feeders or any kinds of fish where they um, are mutually beneficial. Yeah, a couple of ways that they work together. So I focused my talk today on climate mitigation, but I have a whole other research path focused on mitigation of ocean acidification. Ocean acidification is particularly stressful to mussels and other shelled organisms that find it difficult to create that shell material in an ocean that's pH is dropping as the surface waters absorb carbon dioxide. The mutually beneficial situation between seaweed and mussels that we've discovered is that when seaweed is performing photosynthesis and sucking up that CO2, it creates this buffered zone, or we call it the halo effect around the seaweed farm where the carbon dioxide content is lowered and the seawater pH is raised, thereby making it a better place for shellfish to calcify. So when you grow mussels right inside a seaweed farm, they grow harder, thicker shells. Their meat masses even seem to get a bit larger and they get to market size more quickly and more, are more resistant to cracking when you're um, sort of processing them. So a lot of this, well, the, the biggest mussel farmer in Maine, based on the results of the study, has started growing seaweed around his mussel farms to take advantage of that effect. There's another group of colleagues I have working in Maine looking at how seaweed farms may act as an aggregation spot for commercially important invertebrate species or fish species because it creates a sort of three-dimensional structure for those animals to hide under. So there's, there's a couple of ways that the seaweed farming can be a therapeutic process to water quality and the um, marine community around it. Well, I'm, I'm glad you said something about water quality because I was just reading about how every year in the Gulf of Mexico, there's this massive dead zone as a result of runoff from Midwestern farms that makes its way into the Gulf of Mexico. And I think it um, consists primarily of nitrates and phosphorus from the Midwest. And, you know, seaweed has been proposed as something that can soak up these, uh, you know, these pollutants is, uh, have you found that as well? Yeah, we have, we have yet another study working exactly on that. Um, the nutrient bio extraction potential of farm seaweed. So you can think about it being a sponge for nitrogen and phosphorus at uh, runoff as a, in areas of runoff from agriculture or downstream from wastewater treatment plants. There's a couple of ways you could use it as a sponge. Um, and in fact, you know, there's voluntary carbon markets out there and carbon has a value. Nitrogen is far more valuable. Um, and, and there's a model in Connecticut for a voluntary nitrogen market system that seaweed farmers could earn credits for as well. And so that, that's what I'm also working on. I'm trying to figure out the most cost of effective way to quantify nitrogen uptake by seaweeds. It's pretty tricky to make it so that it's a net revenue for a seaweed farm that wants to earn that credit and it doesn't end up costing them more to analyze for nitrogen uptake than the value of the nitrogen would be. But it is a very intriguing possibility and seaweeds are quite adept at that. I think I had read that most seaweed cultivation occurs currently in Asia. And I'm wondering about all the seaweed that we consume and as consumers, either in the form of snacks or sushi, but also as carrageenan in a lot of products. Is all of that seaweed grown in Asia? And if so, what kind of seaweed is it? And does that have anything to do with uh, carbon uh, CO2 sequestration? 
a lot of that seaweed is imported um, and it's dried before it gets here. Um, and food coloring is added to it when it gets rehydrated back in the US. Um, I, th there's a, a similar question in the, in the Q&A about whether other countries are currently using this technology for carbon capture. And I do think that China and Korea are allowing some carbon credits for it, but I have to admit, I don't know a whole lot about how they do that. Um, the, the process of drying seaweed in and of itself can take uh, quite a lot of energy to generate that much heat to get that process done. And so when you have the opportunity to consider buying seaweed that's been produced in the US, it won't have necessarily had to go through that drying process. You can buy it fresh, fresh frozen, um, and it won't have been sort of rehydrated with food coloring. So there's, there's a lot to say for thinking regionally specific about where you want to buy these these products. And even to circle back to your question about using seaweed as livestock feed, we're being very careful to look at um, potential solutions on both the West Coast and the East Coast and other microalgal based solutions for the center of the country so that that transportation um, footprint is as small as possible. So um, we have time for one last question. And what I wanted to ask you about, and this is circling back to this uh, documentary we did a year ago that also featured seaweed. And one of the issues in this documentary was an issue of regulation. And, you know, for instance, one state like Maine might make it quite easy for aquaculture, whereas another state like California might make it very difficult. Are you aware of anything at the federal level to try to smooth out this patchwork of regulations so that aquaculture could start thriving around U.S. coastal areas? I'm not aware of anything happening quite yet. Um, I, do, I do hope that there will be more discussions about that in the future. However, you know, the federal level regulates three miles plus offshore and most of this aquaculture farming happens from shore to three miles off, which that is regulated by states. So I don't know that it will ever be regulated at the federal level. I would say from the farmers that I work with in Maine and Alaska um, and in California, that none would say that it was easy to get an aquaculture lease permit pushed through, that it's quite an arduous and years long process. And there's lots of opportunity for public input during each stage of the process. So. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure whether there will be federal oversight or whether each state feels that there needs to be at this point. Dr. Price, it's been great talking with you um, this evening. Thank you so much for your time and your expertise, and best of luck with you and um, and and seaweed, which really sounds like it's going to be at least one of the things that helps us mitigate climate change. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thanks so much. Well, coming up next, we take a look at something called solar schools. And one of the complaints about solar energy is that the sun is shining during the daytime, but we also need solar power in the evening for things like when we're at home, eating dinner, doing laundry. But there are places that are open during the day that have a lot of flat roofs, and that's schools. So our next segment is actually a video from Generation 180, about their solar schools project. So we're gonna to go to that now. Solar gave us a chance to generate funds, to generate money. It became a game changer for us. Since the year 2014, we've saved $5.2 million. For us, it very much was a lifeline in those years. In Tucson, Arizona, where they have solar parking canopies installed on over 80 schools, they expect to see $43 million in savings over 20 years. 
Generation 180 is a nonprofit organization focused on accelerating the transition to clean energy in the United States. And we're working to provide resources and support to help schools make that transition to clean energy. My name is uh, Gabriel Trujillo. I am the superintendent of the uh, Tucson Unified School District here in Tucson, Arizona. We are uh, one of the largest school districts in the state of Arizona. We serve uh, 42,000 students and we have just shy of 8,000 employees. In terms of our school district, we operate 100 schools, just shy of 100 schools. Our story began right around 2011. During this time, uh, Arizona and school districts around the state were suffering from the Great Recession's unprecedented cuts to school district budgets. You also had major unemployment that led to a lot of families relocating out of the city of Tucson. So the district it was very much in dire financial straits in and around the year 2011. The price of power started to skyrocket as the effects of global warming have hit the desert southwest here in the U.S. harder than anybody else. So you have these forces kind of combining to challenge the district to say, how can we do things differently? By 2015, roughly one year after the first solar panel was installed, we had solar panels installed at 43 of the district schools. 20% of the district's power. By 2019, just shortly before the pandemic, we have solar panels fully installed in 80 of our schools, powering almost 50% of the district. We've saved $5.2 million. You take away that 5.2 million, I'm not able to keep my employees with their yearly raises. And then you get into all the nastiness of teachers leaving the district and teacher shortage getting exacerbated and bus drivers not seeing a raise. And that's a hard to fill position. And assistants working in classrooms with students with disabilities not being able to get a raise. So to be able to keep the raises going, knowing that we had these savings to do other stuff like buy buses and replace computer labs, which we would have had to do at the cost of not moving our employees forward. So yeah, for us, it very much was a lifeline in those years. Going solar can be expensive for school districts. Sometimes a solar installation can cost up to a million dollars or more, depending on the size. Our research found that 79% of the solar capacity installed on schools nationwide was funded by third-party ownership. Through these contracts, typically a solar developer will install, own, and maintain those systems for any length of time, typically 15 to 25 years or longer. So the benefit to the school is that any school can go solar. It doesn't matter what their budget is. The costs of the solar are incurred by the solar developer. The additional benefits of a power purchase agreement is that the school agrees to buy the energy produced by the solar panels, but typically at a rate lower than what they would be paying the utility. So then they're actually seeing savings from day one. We came into a relationship with MidState Energy around 2013, and the deal is until 2034. So in the year 2034, the solar panels will become ours. Essentially, we're going to become a power producer. We're going to own the very source of the electricity that we are generating. There's opportunities for us to generate revenue from this power and possibly be able to sell it back to the grid. The most successful states for going solar have the most solar friendly policies, and that includes states in the Northeast like New York, Massachusetts, New Jersey, and of course, in sunny states like California, Nevada, and Arizona as well. We see other success stories in Batesville, Arkansas, which is a very small school district with only a handful of schools and they went solar and are going to see four million dollars over 20 years in savings but the exciting part is that they're applying those savings to teacher pay so some teachers are seeing up to fifteen thousand dollars per year in raises all paid for by the energy savings from going solar 
for us to put students first, which is our motto, we put students first, you have to start with teachers. And our teachers were the worst in the area for pay. We used to have, we have a staff of about 250 teachers. And we got another 250 classified or hourly help, but 250 teachers. And we used to have anywhere from 30 to 40 of them would leave us each year for better jobs. And I think we're down to single digits now. We are the uh, in the, the upper half of the state's salary. We're number one in the area. So we are attracting and retaining. And we look forward to how all that affects our student achievement. Solar gave us a chance to generate funds, to generate money. It became a game changer for us. In our public school budget, it's, it's nothing to have uh, 75 to 85% of your budget is involved in personnel. And so when you can take your utilities, when you can take your footprint of your entire operations and reduce the cost, then you're able to apply that money. Again, you have to work inside the budget of the money you have. Solar generates income then to add to that. Nonprofits, in our case, have never had that option, and solar creates that opportunity. Through our report that we published last fall, we tracked the number of schools that went solar in the United States up through the end of 2019, and we found 7,332 schools with solar. That's only 5.5% of schools around the country. We would love to see that number go up to 100%. We found that if all schools were 100% solar, we could reduce carbon emissions equal to closing 18 coal-fired power plants. That's a common myth I hear that the amount of sunshine determines how viable solar is in your community. We're finding that most of the restrictions that schools face to go solar are happening at the state level where utility each state and each utility may have different rules so it's a patchwork of policies that you see around the country that might make it easier in california but more difficult in alabama to go solar if you have a political climate in your state that says we want to cut taxes let's say education is funded by maybe three different funds, an income tax, a property tax, and sales tax. If they cut one of those three legs off the stool, then it sends uh, education reeling. There's a fierce dividing line in the U.S. between privatization and the public education infrastructure. And because you're a public district, you have students with disabilities, you have non-English speaking students, you have the poorest of the poor in your city and everybody comes into your building. So you rely on other means to try to bring revenue into the district. You're relying on where you can save dollars and reinvest. That's where solar has been very, very crucial uh, for us to be able to reinvest those dollars. The reason we're excited about schools going solar is that it's contagious. Schools inspire other schools to go solar. When we see a success story in one community, the neighboring school districts also want to get those benefits and we see schools around them going solar as well. So it, it has this inspiring ripple effect that we'd love to see spreading across communities in the U.S. and spreading globally. Welcome back. I hope you all have enjoyed that segment on solar schools. I think that's it's really exciting and I hope it's something that 
we can try to do here in Eagle County. Well, coming up next, we are going to look at another ally in our efforts to mitigate climate change, a furry ally. And we're going to be turning our attention to beavers who were once heavily hunted, um, then to add insult to injury, they were treated as unwelcome guests in their own habitat, but perhaps they're an un overlooked factor in managing the West's most pre precious resource, water, as well as making Western forests more fire resistant. And joining us, we have Peter Sunnison and Dr. Sarah Marshall. Uh, Dr. Marshall has more than 15 years of professional experience in hydrology and ecology with an emphasis on assessing, conserving, and restoring wetlands. Stream, oh, I'm sorry, wetlands and streams in Oregon and Colorado. Her doctoral work in water resources engineering focused on understanding the effects of land use on wetland hydrology, ecology, and water quality across different spatial scales. And she has since applied her training to a diverse array of projects. Peter Sunnison is the Open Space and Outreach Specialist with the Eagle County Government. He's a career environmental educator, a lifelong steward of our natural resources. He is a certified interpretive guide and a Leave No Trace Master Educator and currently works for the Eagle County's Open Space Program. Welcome to both Dr. Marshall and Peter Sunnison. And Dr. Marshall is sharing her slides, so I will hand things over to her. All right, thank you very much, Claire. And good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for the introduction, Claire. And tonight, I'm really excited to talk to you about the quiet, critical role of beavers in helping us deal with climate change in Colorado, but also across the West. I want to give you a quick primer on wetlands and riparian areas. Now, they really serve as the collectors and the organs of our water system. They help us buffer, capture, filter, of water and pollutants from our watersheds. And that can include everything from heavy metals to sediment following fires. They also store carbon to varying degrees in their soil, in sediment, and in both live and dead plant materials. These wetlands are real workhorses. They perform disproportionately high ecological services for us relative to their extent. Now in Colorado, that's only around 2% of our state, or 1.2 million wetland acres. And then a really important piece about wetlands that we'll go back to with beavers is that they really provide their highest level of functions and services when they're in good condition. And in Colorado, we've lost about 50% of our historical wetland area. So we have a lot of room to restore. In the Rocky Mountains, our wetlands carry a special significance because they benefit millions of people living downstream, from drinking water supplies to irrigating food crops. And for other non-human inhabitants, our wildlife, they support about 80% of our Colorado wildlife species at all or some part of their life cycle. Beavers are one of the most critical wetland maintainers and creators, not only in Colorado, but across the West and throughout North America. And we're lucky to still have beavers. In fact, pre-settlement, so a lot of this even cropping occurred prior to 16th um, century, we probably had between 60 and 400 million beavers in North America. Today, we have about nine to 12 million beavers. And we don't actually even know how many beavers we have in the state of Colorado. And I think you all know that we're looking at a warmer, drier, and weirder future, both in Colorado and throughout the West. I pulled this drought monitor map for the state of Colorado today. And as you can see, particularly on the western slope of Colorado, a lot of our state is in drought conditions. Now, in addition to drought, we have a lot of concerns around things like earlier snowmelt. So we're looking at two weeks or more earlier snowmelt already in some parts of the state and certainly into the future. In addition to that, we are looking at longer wildfire seasons. 
And we're also just generally seeing warmer conditions in our state. To me, that's pretty scary in terms of things like looking at future wildfires. But fear not, beavers are here to help. Now, beavers can help us with many aspects of climate change from carbon storage in their soil and sediment of wetlands and also in living and dead plants that are encouraged by these nice ponds that beaver create. But they also really help us adapt to climate change impacts and even mitigate for climate change impacts in our state. So they can help capture and slowly release earlier snow melt as well as floodwaters. They can help us with drought by creating these nice refuges for wildlife and even for humans. They can also help us with fires from fire breaks across large complexes of beaver wetlands to helping trap sediment in the pools behind dams after a fire. So beavers are incredibly resilient. So why beavers and why not have humans do all this work? Well, for one, they're virtually free and they're capable of restoring degraded streams over enormous areas in the mountains. For humans, it can cost over a million dollars to restore a mile of a mountain stream. Now in the state of Colorado, we have on the order of nearly 100,000 miles of stream. Many of those are degraded. And by degraded, I mean sometimes the streams no longer connect to their floodplains, they have water quality issues, they may be obstructed by human-made dams. So we have a lot of work to do. And beavers, they're more numerous than human restoration practitioners. They're also pretty dynamic. So they move around in watersheds to where they're needed. And they're really good at maintaining their work. And the photo uh, on this slide is actually up in the Maroon Bells wilderness. And you can see where beavers have built a new dam that blew out in 2019 when we had the big snow melt year. They're just constantly moving around and maintaining these dams and ponds. And just to give you an example of a human restoration project versus a beaver site, on the left, you can see kind of the left side of the wetland is impacted by beavers. And I get excited about areas like this because they have ponds, willow shrublands, wet meadows, they support a variety of wetland species from songbirds to native wetland plants. And that's a really complex and biodiverse habitat. Now, on the right, we have an area that was restored by humans. Both of these areas had historical dredge mining activities. They're both approximately a half mile long. I can tell you the human project cost about $2 million. And that was very carefully designed with the stream, but for me, I like it to be a little messy and dynamic. That's better habitat. So what can we do to help beavers in a changing West, in a warmer West? I'm gonna propose two pretty simple things. First, we can coexist with beavers and we're learning new ways to do that every day. An example I saw a few weeks ago, this is State Highway 9 near Breckenridge in the mountains of Colorado. And I wanna show you just a little four year time series. So in the first image, you can see that this wetland area is kind of brown, it's late season. I don't see any ponds here. In the second image, four years later, all of a sudden we have a bunch of beaver ponds and it's much more lush. So what changed here? Well, the answer lies in this little circle. Let's zoom in to see what that looks like on the ground. So this is what's called a pond leveler. So what was happening here, beavers kept building dams or flooding State Highway 9, which was expensive, inconvenient, and ultimately not good for the beavers because they were being lethally trapped. So the county and also the Colorado Department of Transportation were had enough foresight to try something different. So these pond levelers basically keep the water level from exceeding a certain height that will flood the highway. And there are several of them here around dams. 
So the beavers can go about their business. They can create dams. They can even make new channels, trim willows. All the while, they're not flooding the highway. And this is just one of many coexistent strategies that we now have in our toolbox, from fencing cottonwoods and urban parks to even sand paint to keep beavers from chewing down mature trees. The next thing that we can do is we can help connect habitat. Now the series on the right shows the west entrance of Rocky Mountain National Park in the headwaters of the Colorado River. And over time, you can see a loss of beaver ponds, a loss of connectivity between the stream and the meadow, and ultimately we're left with a dry meadow or an elk meadow. So this is a perfect candidate for habitat reconnection. This is an area where rivers and beavers have room to roam without impacting human infrastructure, without causing any problems. And it's an area that the beavers can also have a great benefit for our ecosystems and our water supply. This is the headwaters for the Colorado River. So water supply for agriculture, for municipal use, millions of people downstream. A couple other things that we can do here, we can start replanting willows, cottonwoods, aspen for beaver to help give them food and materials for building dams. And we can also be creative. Now, if we get beavers back here, it's in a national park. That's great. If this was in an area with a bunch of ranches, maybe we might want to consider something like Airbnb beaver, where we can compensate landowners for allowing beavers to work on their land. And I'm excited to turn this over to Peter now with Eagle County Open Space, who's going to show us a real world example as a land manager looking at the possibility of beavers helping restore a degraded stream, much like what I've just shown you. Thank you, Dr. Marshall. Very great introduction um, and kind of a, a, a broad overview of the benefits that beavers can have um, in different ecosystems. Let me get my screen going here. Excuse me, let's see here. All righty. So, um, again, my name is Peter Sunnison. I'm with the Eagle County Open Space Program. And what I wanted to do, to do today is kind of take Dr. Marshall's broad overview and kind of present a beginning of a, a case study that we're able to work on here on Eagle County Open Space. Um, and so just as a, a reminder or some information for folks who are not as familiar with the Open Space Department or program here in Eagle County, um, it was uh, established almost 20 years ago. Um, we are funded by a mill levy on property taxes. And I think what is really exciting, um, looking at my last bullet point up there, that in 2018, 81% of Eagle County voters voted to reauthorize the program for another 20 years so it does not sunset until 2040. And then conversations with Dr. Marshall when I was sharing um, you know, a little bit about our program and then again, our conservation criteria she was you know, really excited about the point that Eagle County and, and the citizens in Eagle County are really putting their money where their mouth is. They have voted to protect wildlife habitat by funding our program. And so just a, a basic overview of how uh, properties or lands get conserved through the open space program is that um, a staff takes phone calls, goes out and seeks out properties. We bring, uh, bring those to an open space advisory committee, which is made up of uh, citizen experts from around the county, and they vet those through our conservation criteria. And these six criteria were established um, in the open space resolution, and this is what they really look at um, when deciding whether or not to acquire or conserve a property. Ultimately, that recommendation from our advisory committee and staff goes to the Board of County Commissioners who ultimately make a decision on whether or not to spend money conserving a piece of property. And so the case study that I wanted to briefly introduce to folks today is on the Brush Creek Valley Ranch in Open Space. Um, it's our newest acquisition. It is a 1,671-acre property. Uh, local folks may know it as Hard Scrabble Ranch or Adams Rib Ranch. Um, it was, uh, uh, many folks probably know the history, but this is a decades-old um, conservation project that finally came to fruition in 2017 um, with the help of the Conservation Fund, the Town of Eagle, Eagle Ranch Wildlife Committee, CPW, the Eagle Valley Land Trust, and GOCO. 
Um, the entire property is conserved, uh, is held in conservation easement by the local Eagle Valley Land Trust. And if you look um, kind of at my map on the right there, you can see that we have about 2.5 miles of Brush Creek traveling through the property. Um, again, this is a ranch. This is a, a you know a working ranch, and historically, and in, in the past decade or so, it was ranched. What we say, we say it was ranched to sell houses, and so it was sustainability and, and um, other kind of ranching practices were not at the forefront. This property um, is degraded um, quite a bit in some stretches. And so what does it mean when we, kind of, when we talk about managing it? This property hit all six of those conservation criteria. And so what we're trying to do out there is balance both the wildlife habitat, the access to dispersed recreation, um, the agricultural heritage and history. We have a working range there. We have a lessee who runs a cow-calf operation and cuts hay out there. We try to balance all of those conservation values. And the easiest way to you know, really balance all of those values that are, are so dear to our community is to take a really light touch. Um, and one of the easiest way to do that is with this low tech process based restoration or LTB, LTPBR. And what I'm really talking about there is, uh, uh, in this case is biomimicry. What we're looking at is creating structures, um, you know, manually creating structures that beavers may have done if they were in that area. So we were utilizing two techniques BDAs and PALs, beaver dam analog structures and post assisted log structures. And why I think this is such a neat um, process is that restoration is inherently a process, process oriented practice where the outcome is uncertain. Really, restoration is a, a kickstart to those natural process. You know, a lot of folks here re restore restoration, and I blame the HDTV crowd for you know, making it seem like that is taking it back to a, a condition of the past. That's not really what restoration seeks to do. Restoration seeks to kickstart natural form and function of an ecological system to get it in that historic trajectory, which in turn hopefully will catch up and repair some of those degraded systems. So what I've got here is just a, a, a brief overview for folks that are familiar with Brush Creek Road. This is the northernmost section of Brush Creek Valley Ranch in open space. Um, in between the ranch headquarters building and the town of Eagle Water Building, a little blue shed um, on the west side of Brush Creek. And as you can see here, um, it is relatively channelized. You can see some of the pictures, not a lot of riparian vegetation. This, is not, this system is not maintaining the five C's of a healthy riparian ecosystem or a healthy stream, which is cold, clear, complex, connected, cold, clear, com complex, connected, and consistent. So we're not seeing those. And so what we're looking to do out there, oh, sorry, here are some pictures of that system. Here we have, you know, devoid of riparian vegetation on the left. Um, and then you can see some channelization and a, and a ditch irrigation structure on the right. So again, this is a working ranch. Um, some of these areas are where we're looking to employ some of those biomimicry and even, even some of those structures that Dr. Marshall um, discussed earlier. So on the left here is a BDA, a beaver dot, beaver dam analog structure. And essentially what this is, is a, is a human created beaver dam. We are undertaking the same process that they would, stopping the river, minimizing that, that energy coming into a stream, spreading out the water, creating new wetlands, creating ponds. On the right, we've got a PALS or a post assisted log structure. And again, what this intends to do is diffuse that energy of the stream, create new pools, new, new channels, really replicate beaver activity in the area. It is our hope that by putting these devices or, or these uh, installations in, we will then promote uh, a suitable habitat for beavers and get some natural um, recruitment into those areas. Here are some BDAs uh, and PALs in action. And then this larger picture on the left are some models of uh, the, the pond levelers or what we, we did call beaver deceivers. Um, that, that were brought out to show us kind of how we might be able to utilize a system like this in our ranching infrastructure. Again, this is what we're looking for. I think this picture on the left was one of the most exciting days um, when I, I, since I've been with Open Space. What we're seeing here is an oxbow 
um, or a new channel being created. There is an upland dam that is pushing water onto an irrigated field. And this is actually channeling backwards, creating an entirely new stream bed. And so finally, just to bring this all around to building a climate resiliency that to follow up on Dr. Marshall's uh, presentation, promoting these, these beaver dam habitat and this beaver dam ecology, we're promoting biomass accumulation and biodiversity. We're storing water during our historic drought cycles. We're creating natural fire breaks and we're creating these wetlands that are able to sequester carbon um, and, and at a much higher rate. Again, using these low tech process-based restoration, restoration techniques, we're effectively using what is there. We're minimizing transportation costs. We're minimizing fuel to bring in machinery and do this digging. Um, we're doing this by hand and really we're, we're acting as beavers. Um, we're creating our air, our own air being at beaver. And with that, um, I think Claire, if we've got time for questions, happy to take them. Peter, Dr. Marshall, thank you both very much. Unfortunately, we are out of time and I apologize. This is completely my fault for not budgeting more time for beavers. But I tell you, I started reading about beavers and I'm like, these are furry allies. We have not been kind enough to them and they could do a lot of good for us. Just one last question for you. Um, you mentioned, you know, you showed the drastic drop in the beaver population in the Western United States down to just maybe 12 million, what would be an ideal number or a realistic number today? What would you like to see that number at? Oh, goodness. I wish I could answer that. Um, I will say that in uh, working with Julie Scamardo and Ellen Wall at CSU and modeling beaver dam capacity, so our current rate, and I wrote this down to make sure I didn't forget, it's uh, 1.36 million dams. Historically, we're at about 2.39. So I would love some approximation of enough beavers to make some semblance of our historical dam capacity. So double, at least. <laughs> Dr. Marshall, Peter Sunnison, thank you both so much for this fascinating discussion. One thing I did hear that just to put things into perspective, beavers have been building dams for thousands of years longer than humans have been building dams. And they could be a really great resource if we would just be a little bit kinder to them. So thank you both very much. We now are going to turn our attention to carbon tax. And I will say that Americans have a reflexive dislike for the word tax. It seems to be in our DNA, but what if a tax could be used as a policy tool to change or modify polluting behavior? So we welcome now carbon tax expert Katrina Rourke, along with Commissioner Matt Scher. Katrina Rourke is Vice President for Policy at the Climate Leadership Council. In this role, she develops the details of the Baker Schultz Carbon Dividends proposal in consultation with 48 founding members, including corporate leaders, environmental nonprofits, and influential individuals. She also manages the council's research program and supports the council's advocacy and outreach activities. Matt Scher is currently an Eagle County Commissioner. He was previously on Minturn, Colorado's town council, and some of that tenure was he served as mayor. His background includes an undergraduate degree in psychology, an early career in telecommunications, a transition to community leadership development, a pivot to community sustainability practices, and just general entrepreneurial subsistence living. His greatest priority as county commissioner is a people and planet-centered economy, which he sees as our best chance to address the climate crisis. I will turn the program over now to Commissioner Matt Scher and Katrina Rourke. Welcome to both of you. Oh, Matt, you're muted. No, I was. Thanks very much for that introduction, Claire. I appreciate it. Uh, and Katrina, thanks very much for uh, spending your time with us here tonight. Uh, I'm really excited to talk to you tonight, not, uh, not only because that uh, list of bona fides is much more impressive and cool than mine, um, but uh, because of the topic we get to talk about tonight too. Um, I, I know you've, with that impressive CV as well, I don't know if you've ever had to follow beavers, but I think what's convenient about that is, is beavers and kind of all the other things that are in this program tonight, and honestly, all the other things that we often talk about with climate, 
beavers, seaweed, uh, solar on roofs, whether it's the recycling I do and changing out light bulbs in my home, uh, these are all tactics that are important to climate change. But what you're talking about tonight is really a systemic approach to solve our climate crisis. And that's solving not despite our market economy, but through that very free market, which has been called the most powerful force humans have ever created. So take that beavers. Um, so what I'd love for you to do, Katrina, is start out tonight to help us understand uh, carbon tax in terms of a lot of these other things that we do uh, from a policy perspective, what our choices are for, for particular policy frameworks and then how uh, carbon tax fits into that. Sure, Matt. So um, thank you for having me. It's really, it's a joy to be with you today. This is Climate Week. It's also National Clean Energy Week, um, which means we've heard uh, a whole lot of folks from around the world and around DC talking a whole lot about um, climate success stories, policy movement. Um, so I'm really excited to share some of that good news with you today. Thank you for having me. Um, I hope that because I'm here, I can get in on Airbnb uh, and we can bring some of them out to Rock Creek Park in DC. Um, okay, let's start by, um, by breaking down the three um, sort of crude categories of policy that we can use to reduce emissions um, that we commonly talk about in policy circles. Um, so the first form is regulation. You can through uh, through like the Environmental Protection Agency direct industry to adopt certain technologies or practices or stop using certain technologies or practices, um, and use that mandate to reduce emissions from a, a specific sector um, from a specific type of facility. Regulations tend to be really narrowly targeted when it comes to emissions reductions. You can subsidize. You can do things like incentivize research and development by pumping money into the university system um, through the national labs that the Department of Energy runs. You can also offer specific discrete payments. So um, the production tax credit, for example, to bring renewable power online in the United States. Subsidies are a really common way of uh, lowering the costs of things that um, produce fewer emissions. And then there's this third category, the one that I work in, where you price the bad. So instead of trying to figure out um, regulations for every discrete sector that you wanna reduce emissions from, or writing the right kinds of incentive and payment programs um, for all of the sectors that you wanna see emissions reductions from, um, what you can do is just put a price on carbon. It's a little bit like, like you can set it and forget it because once it's in place, you don't need to renew the policy year over year for it to, to change behavior. Um, and it creates a sort of systemic um, tilt in the marketplace. Right now it's free to release CO2 emissions into the atmosphere. As soon as you price it, people are gonna start making decisions so they reduce fewer emissions and they're gonna do that everywhere emissions exist in the economy. Um, so yeah, it's, it's sort of like set it and forget it because once it's in place, um, you're gonna see how it sort of evolves and, and affects the whole economy rather than um, policies where you might have to go back and edit them in because they're not having the impact that you quite want them to. Right, so this is a, um, a way then it sounds like um, th there's a term that economists use called externalities and pollution is always the best example we use, at least that's what we use in the, new, the environmental world. The externality is a cost, but it's a cost that uh, a, a business or a unit or whatever that consideration is manages to take off its books. That doesn't mean the cost goes away, it just means it goes away for that entity. And uh, it sounds like what you're talking about is this is a way to encapsulate all that externality within the market so it doesn't escape, which ultimately that, that's a form of trickle down always comes down to the people. That one we can guarantee always comes down to the people. That's where the cost is ultimately born, uh, like with landfills and we deal with trash and those types of things. But what you're talking about is finding a way to put that back into the realm of the market so it can address it at, through innovation or efficiencies or anything else the market does. Yeah, 
That's right, Matt. So um, there's two categories of externalities, right? Positive externalities and negative externalities. In climate change, the negative externality is easy to see. It's free to release emissions right now in the United States and most other jurisdictions around the world. The positive externality is a little bit harder to see. It's companies that are at the leading edge of changing their practices or communities that are at the leading edge of adopting really good behaviors, even if those aren't cost saving in the near term. And a carbon price prices that negative externality brings that onto the balance sheet and it um, pays people for the positive externalities that they're already creating today. Um, and so you'd mentioned these, these three different broad categories of how we might approach this from a policy perspective. Um, price, uh, essentially market signals uh, is what we've got with the carbon tax. Um, right now, Congress is considering a really big budget bill, um, which it seems to always be doing these days, but a really big budget bill and a lot of what's currently in there uh, are a lot of climate strategies. Um, can you use some of the things that are in that bill right now as examples of the other policy strategies that you've mentioned? Um, sure. So in the present legislation that's being debated, um, at least the version from the House of, of Representatives is, is a, a new policy called the Clean Energy Payment Program. Um, it's, it functions like, um, like a renewable portfolio standard or a clean energy standard. Those standards have been adopted at the state level for quite some time in the United States, brings that to the federal level. It would um, establish a baseline for companies. Um, so every utility has their emissions intensity baseline and ask them to improve upon that baseline 4% every year. If you do that, this policy will pay you. If you don't do that, uh, this policy will charge you. And so it's designed to sort of tip the scales in favor of improving the carbon efficiency in the electricity sector over time. It's a regulatory policy, but it's also using a carrot and a stick with these, with these payment and fee programs um, built into it. So it's a little bit like a hybrid policy. Um, I said that these were sort of like crude areas, right? Because in the bipartisan infrastructure deal, there's also several attempts at deregulation or, or regulatory reform so that we can build more things. It's really challenging in the United States to build new energy infrastructure of, of any kind. We hear a lot about pipelines. It's also true for um, transmission lines, for wind farms or solar farms. So there's um, regulatory reform proposals in the bipartisan package so that we can um, figure out how to build things a little bit faster. Um, those are just two examples of, of policies that are sitting in the bills open for consideration in Congress today. Yeah, and you know what I find is an interesting situation, though I shouldn't be surprised in peculiar political situations anymore. Um, a, a lot of your bio describes you as center-right. Uh, a lot of the policy work you've done is center-right. And currently, uh, President Biden has suggested that he's not really into the idea of a carbon tax. Uh, so this is uh, a liberal Democrat saying no tax and a center right person saying tax is the appropriate tool. So it's a little backwards, but uh, uh, how did we get to this situation um, where we're on the other side of the political fence? Is, is President Biden's more of a, a political position right now thinking what it is he might be able to get through um, or is it uh, not thinking in those broad terms of categories thinking of this as a right approach? And perhaps you don't know President Biden's thinking, but I'll ask anyway. Yeah, I, I can't. I can't tell you what the president is thinking, um, but I can tell you that a carbon price, a carbon tax, has bipartisan support. Um, what we're hearing out of the Senate is a whole lot of emphasis from senators um, like Senator Sheldon Whitehouse and Senator Brian Schatz, Senator Chris Coons, um, folks who sort of span the gamut from quite left to moderate left, who are pushing heavily to involve a carbon price in their, in their climate plans in these most recent legislative packages because they know it's really effective climate solution. There's a concern right now in DC that between a trillion dollars on infrastructure and a trillion to three and a half trillion dollars on a reconciliation package, we can invest $4.5 trillion in the economy and it's not enough to cut emissions at the scale and speed required by the climate challenge. Once you spend four and a half trillion dollars, it's really hard to figure out how to spend more money. 
seems like the appetite for using one of our three categories, that subsidies category is going to be dramatically eroded. And so we're seeing climate advocates really boost a carbon price because they know it's the most efficient mode for reducing emissions across the economy. But we still have some, some chance uh, politically. And we'll talk about some of that support as well because it's important. But before we get to that support, that support that you're talking about, a lot of that is for a very particular thing that, uh, uh, that you are promoting as well. So you're with the Climate Leadership Council and one of the most uh, primary things the Climate Leadership Council is promoting uh, is a carbon dividend plan uh, I'll let you decide how, how you want to name it tonight, but I wonder if you'd uh, walk through us. This is a specific idea for a carbon tax with some uh, particular components, even outside of the carbon tax itself. And I wonder if you'd take a moment to, to describe that for us. Sure, thanks. So um, in early 2017, my organization was founded um, by uh, several uh, Republican luminaries. Folks have been shaping the, the economic policy of the Republican Party for quite some time, including former Republican secretaries of state, secretaries of everything, um, James Baker and the late George Schultz. And what they came out with was a four part plan to address carbon emissions in a way that benefited uh, households and the economy more broadly. So four parts, interdependent parts, we advocate for them as a package. A price on carbon emissions, which will let us uh, reduce emissions more effectively than any other policy that we know about. A dividend, so we take the revenue from that carbon price and we distribute it to households on a quarterly basis. In the first year, a family of four will get about $2,000 and the vast majority of Americans will come out more financially ahead with this policy than without it. Regulatory simplification. Um, there's a place for regulation, but sometimes it gets in the way. Uh, businesses have a hard time deciding what to invest in. Um, and the regulatory interventions that we've thought of so far, especially on CO2 emissions, haven't been effective. So let's pull those back and let the most efficient tool achieve emissions reductions. And then fourth and finally, a border carbon adjustment. That would help us make sure that we're pricing all the emissions um, from goods overseas as they come into the economy. That means we have a new system of accountability for emitters in China and in Russia and in India that pollute a whole lot more than we do here. And it also ensures that we're putting domestic manufacturers who are cleaner um, ahead of the game by pricing emissions of imports. So it's a four part plan. We advocate for all of it together. Um, and we've been developing that policy for the last several years um, with our founding members, our, our bona fides, as you said. Um, I, can, I can share those now if that's, if that's helpful. That'd be great. Okay, let me see if I can share screen. Here, Claire may have oh, it as well. Oh, Claire, thank that. you. Yes, um, so with uh, these founding members, we've been developing the policy um, we have corporate founding members. They run the gamut. So we have insurers, technology firms, um, consumer facing groups, people who make everything from an automobile to a bag of chips. Um, they help us figure out how to make this policy workable. We also have a whole lot of energy founding members that also run the gamut. Some of the biggest energy producers in the United States and around the world. Um, folks who get oil and gas out of the ground, folks who make the cleanest solar panels in the world, um, they help us figure out how to make this policy work well for the energy industry. We work with three environmental nonprofits. They keep us honest to the environmental ambition of the plan. This is first and foremost, a climate policy. And then um, a bipartisan bench of individuals who are helping us shape this policy because they have particular expertise or they're really interested in this kind of solution. So um, everybody, as I said, from, from the late George Schultz and James Baker to Janet Yellen, not currently active. She's a little bit busy as the Secretary of the Treasury, um, but we really are bipartisan. We're anchored in finding a solution that works on both sides of the aisle. Yeah, and that's uh, uh, impressive as well. And it does a number of things. I wanted to talk about some of those pillars you've got, uh, particularly <laughs> how they address a lot of the objections that we typically hear about when it comes to really just about any climate policy as well. Um, we'll start with that last one that you've mentioned as well, and that's the, the border adjustment. Uh, the argument that we've typically heard is, you know, China is now, uh, I think they've uh, superseded us as the largest economy and they're certainly uh, growing a lot faster than we are and they're still building coal plants. Um, 
And the argument is, why would we go through all this and cost our economy and cost jobs, which is another debatable point, when uh, China is doing it and it's a global problem? And so this is an answer to that. And I wonder if you can talk more about that as not just how that uh, works there, but how that can also benefit our nation and that if we're leading in these things, then that can become a market for our solutions. Yeah, terrific. So um, uh, the border carbon adjustment is, is a really incredible tool. We can unlock that tool by, by pricing carbon emissions. That's why it's one of our four interdependent pillars here. Um, one of the things that's held back climate progress is this rhetorical argument that climate policy is going to hamper economic growth or cost jobs because we'll have costs in our economy that our competitors won't have. This is also true in the European Union. They are going through an evolution in their climate policy right now because they're being held back by policies they've built in um, to address these concerns about international competitiveness. We're not alone. Um, in, in failing to address the climate problem at the scale and speed required because of the concern about competitiveness. So let's directly solve it. Every good that's sold in the United States should have the same carbon costs associated with it. There is no competitive advantage to making a widget overseas instead of here at home. We don't have to uh, uh, take for granted that there's a competitiveness concern. We can, we can put everybody on a par. And it just so happens that the United States is a really clean economy. So um, we've looked at relative carbon intensity of production across economic sectors, across countries, and it takes 80% more carbon emissions to create the same dollar of value anywhere else in the world than it does in the United States. 80% more emissions to make something overseas. We can't, we can't have a climate policy that allows that to continue, right? We, we should make more things at home. Even if the United States makes more things at home, we're going to decarbonize the globe, right? It's perfectly consistent with long-term decarbonization and a stable climate future for the globe. So um, let's figure out a way to monetize that carbon advantage today. We can do that with a border adjustment. We studied the steel industry. If we price the carbon emissions associated with steel, um, we, we benefit US producers. The United States is the cleanest steel manufacturer of all of our trading partners. So if we price those emissions, we're gonna cut imports in half and increase sale of domestic made steel because we're cleaner. So we can leverage that advantage. We can also um, create a new system of accountability. So for the first time, we'll be pricing emissions associated with imports from much more carbon intensive economies like China, like India, like Russia. And that's a tremendous benefit for the, for the climate. And it creates an incentive for those producers to start thinking seriously about decarbonizing if they wanna be competitive in the largest consumer market in the world. And then finally, the more we make at home in this really carbon efficient economy, the more we'll be able to supply um, a really hungry global economy looking for clean energy solutions. So let's do it. Yeah, and again, that's that unleashing that market force uh, to do what it wants. And so the here's the part, one of the parts that I think that makes uh, progressives, uh, liberals a little nervous is that is that third pillar regarding that is letting the market go. And this would be more of a conservative approach is saying less government, less regulation, um, which uh, we know that regulate because of that word, that's, that's the idea, whether for positive or, or a potentially negative economic effect, it's regulating something, it's controlling it. Um, so if we, if we release some of these things so that the market efficiencies can take effect, um, that the, that the thing that makes progressive nervous but you also have something built into there that understanding that this is a thing over time we have to watch and nobody's exactly certain how it will go, but can you talk about the mechanism you have built in as well, just as a, a bit of a safeguard? Absolutely. So um, the price that we talk about in the carbon dividends plan, um, it starts at $40 a ton. It rises 5% year over year. If we enact that price starting in 2023, um, we'll cut emissions in half by 2035 if it's the only thing we do, right? No new fuel economy standards for cars, um, no natural climate solutions from the agricultural community, no other interventions, just the carbon price, we'll cut emissions in half by 2035. 
if we want to stay on track with that, we should build in some safeguards. And so we talk about an emissions assurance mechanism, which makes sure that if we fall off track from hitting that emissions target, we can increase that rate on the carbon fee so that we're, um, we're extracting more emissions reductions from the economy. We make sure that we're pricing emissions to reach those performance targets that we're interested in. Okay, and this is, um, we'll back into that second pillar. Um, uh, and, and this is the dividend. So this is, uh, um, what do we call this, revenue neutral? So budget, money, budget neutral, but yeah, yeah, neutral. revenue neutral is fun. So uh, this is where um, conservatives get nervous with the tax too, is they tend to think of it as this way for the government to raise money to do what it does. And very often we think of the government not doing great at what it does, but what you're doing with the money in this revenue sense is sending it back to uh, taxpayers um, and everybody gets the same amount of money. Um, but as you talked about, um, most people will have a net benefit. Gas prices will rise, the things that take carbon will rise as cost, but you're also getting more income. Keeping in mind that uh, <clears throat> the people who create the greatest uh, uh, carbon impact that is, if you buy a yacht and then you buy another yacht to hold the helicopter for your yacht, then you're going to be paying a whole lot of money, but you're still only getting, you know, the two thousand dollars or whatever that amount of money is. Um, so, uh, the importance of this is in this plan, if I understand it, is that essentially revenue neutrality. Mm -hmm. um, and then the concern that some may have is, will that truly work? in the sense of regressive tax, if the cost of just about everything will go up because so much of our economy is based on carbon, will that truly work for uh, the people that we typically see as, as uh, often some of the most, the largest victims in an economy, what we call environmental justice, who suffer the most from that? It's an excellent question, Matt. So um, much like the border adjustment, there are several motivations for the dividend. Um, the first is if we impose a price on carbon and let the government figure out how to spend the money, um, they're going to come up with a really wise plan to spend 150% of the revenue, no problem. And so um, rather than uh, uh, have a fight over the right way to invest revenue in decarbonization or any other kinds of priorities, let's mobilize American families. At the end of the day, carbon fees are going to be passed through in prices to varying degrees across the economy, but American households are going to end up paying at least a portion of the carbon fee. And if we provide households with a dividend with a share of that revenue, they're going to be in a better position to make smart decisions for their family as they figure out how to reduce their carbon emissions and reduce their fee burden over time. We want to give them the money that they need to make wise decisions for their family. We can also create um, 330 million stakeholders in, in the climate program. If, if every American gets a dividend, then every American is financially invested in the most effective climate solution that we have at our disposal, which gives it political staying power. We want to avoid um, the ability to create a climate policy that can be rolled back with a change in the political makeup of the Senate or the White House, right? And most importantly, um, if we use something like a dividend to send revenue back to American households, it's the most vulnerable Americans that come out most ahead. So the very low income Americans will spend a greater percentage of their income on energy and energy services gas for their car, heating for their homes, um, but a smaller overall level than very rich people who spend a small percentage of their income on energy and energy services, but a large overall value. So um, Jeff Bezos and his rocket ship are not going to come out ahead with a carbon dividends plan, um, but the lowest income Americans absolutely will. Um, based on our modeling, the average household in the lowest eight income deciles will be better off financially with the carbon dividends plan than they are today. All right, and I want to leave uh, some time for questions, but so just one more area I want you to, to discuss. Um, the, uh, I have heard from economists that uh, promote a carbon tax as a solution that say, 
had we done this 30 years ago, the market would have already solved this problem or already put us on the pathway to, to solving because we know that there's a time limit. Our window is closing, making uh, the, the, uh, the ability to create solutions narrower and narrower. Um, so what I want to talk about too is given that, that our timeline is, is uh, decreasing, talk about urgency. Yeah, uh, a motivating question for sure. So uh, it took us 30 years to displace the horse as the primary mode of transportation once the automobile was available. And the automobile was absolutely better. Uh, it, it allowed you a lot more flexibility. You could be inside. I mean, it was, it was a better solution. And it took us 30 years to change the model. We don't have that kind of time when it comes to climate change. We're talking about deep decarbonization by mid-century. And so we need to make sure that we're using policies that are really good at deploying the solutions that we already have available today, things that we know how to do well, like wind, like solar, like geothermal and hydro and nuclear, but also that provide that long-term incentive to innovate and bring to market the best solutions for the future. Um, so we want to make sure that the policy is durable and effective. A carbon price does all of that, but it's not a silver bullet. So uh, absolutely, it's the most effective tool that we have available. Absolutely, it needs to be part of the climate solution in the United States, but we're going to need other policies to help us get over the finish line. Well, Tariq, uh, Katrina, I really appreciate this time, and, and we do want to leave time for questions. Uh, Claire, are you able to moderate those questions? I am. Thank you both very yeah. much. And just a reminder for your, the audience to please put your questions in the Q&A option at the bottom. And so what I'd like Katrina to address, if you can, is what other countries have instituted a carbon tax or are thinking of one? It's a great question. So um, we actually have carbon prices in the United States, um, not carbon taxes, but cap and trade programs. We have those in the Northeast. California has one operational. Um, and it's coming in in Washington and I think Oregon now. Our neighbors to the north have a carbon price. Um, so Canada has a provincial program with a federal backstop. If the carbon price in a province isn't high enough, then the federal price comes into play. Our neighbors to the south have a carbon price. It's low, around $5 a ton, but they have one. Those are our two biggest trading partners. The European Union has been operating an emissions trading system um, for fifth, more than 15 years now to reduce their emissions. Um, there are carbon prices all around the world right now, not sufficient to put us on track for our greenhouse gas emissions reductions and our, our long-term temperature targets. Um, but most of the most developed economies have some form of a carbon price in place today. So I'm glad you brought up the European Union because uh, the Financial Times is reporting that there's widespread backlash to the European Commission's proposal to extend a carbon tax to cars and heating for buildings, which would include homes. Um, as they said, carbon pricing versus voters' wallets is the next political battle of our time. And so I read that and I know you were going to talk about carbon dividends at this time. So I'm just wondering why the European Union isn't considering or are they a carbon dividend? Yeah, it's a it's a great question, Claire. It's it's clear from our analysis, from our polling, from the research that we've done that it's really important to bring households along with you. They are gonna end up seeing the price impacts of whatever we do to address carbon emissions in the United States, be it a fee, be it subsidies for other kinds of fuels, be it regulation. It's really important to give households what they need to, to survive, to thrive in a scenario where we're reducing our carbon emissions. Is there a tipping point? I mean, you know, if we, if we do this in this, um, this package, this uh, infrastructure package, um, Will countries just go somewhere else where it's easy to trade? And um, or if we do this and the European Union beefs their uh, carbon tax or carbon pricing, you know, does that sort of create a tipping point where countries really have no other place to go and they're just going to have to start to comply? Uh, so if, if the European Union and the United States figure out how to build some kind of border carbon adjustment club together, right? So um, 
every other emitter has to pay to get into the European and the U.S. markets, we're going to cover more than 40% of the economy, the global economy, with this carbon price. And there's a huge appetite to have access to the European and the American markets because we've got really powerful consumers that can shape the way things are made around the world. And so um, it's, it's, it's really, it's, it's an inevitable position now for global economies that we're gonna be pricing emissions embedded in global trade. The Europeans have already started the process. We've heard interest from the White House, from Canadians, from the UK, from the Japanese, um, it's gonna happen. And um, yes, eventually um, there will be no escape. You're going to have to account for your carbon emissions to be viable in the biggest consumer markets in the world. So one of the arguments I heard against a carbon tax was this idea of cross-border carbon leakage. And it sounds like if we get to this tipping point, cross-border carbon leakage really doesn't even matter anymore. Right. So this this concern about leakage is why we're really emphasizing a border carbon adjustment, which can nip leakage in the bud. Um, but it's it's also important that we we figure out what kind of levers we can pull in the United States and worldwide to move um, from a race to the bottom so that the, the dirtiest goods come out most ahead to a race to the top. Right. We want to use all the tools at our disposal to ensure that we're sending the best signals through the economy for the private sector to increase efficiency, reduce carbon emissions, and stay on that path to deep decarbonization over time. You know, I understand that this used to be a bipartisan issue that, and I'm not so sure that it is anymore. I actually had an opportunity to ask that question of Senator um, Michael Bennett, one of Colorado's senators, and he agreed that, you know, just a few years ago, a carbon tax was a bipartisan issue. So I'm just wondering, um, especially since Matt alluded to the president's perhaps um, equivocating on this issue as to whether he supports it or not, uh, does it make it into this package and does it have champions in the Senate and the, in, the, in the House to make sure that we, you know, we keep this what sounds like an incredible, powerful policy tool? It's a, it's a terrific question, Claire, and, and we'll see. Um, recent analysis came out and it says that all of the policies on the table right now in these um, very ambitious spending packages won't reduce emissions enough to reach the Biden administration's 2030 pledge. We're going to spend four and a half trillion dollars and we're still not going to get to our emissions targets. And so there are really um, deep supporters of a carbon price on the Hill. And um, from, from what we hear, they're trying to make sure that a carbon price stays on the table um, for consideration. At the Climate Leadership Council, we're advocating for this policy to move forward with all four parts intact. That's not really available to us through the reconciliation process, um, but we are keeping our ear to the ground um, because it, it's, it's getting interesting. So one last question, and this comes from Leslie. She said, you said earlier that the US is the carbon cleanest producer in the world. You also note that many other countries have carbon taxes. Doesn't that suggest that carbon taxes are not working if the country without such a tax is the cleanest producer? Oh, it's a, a terrific question. So um, if you want to learn more about how the United States is a clean economy, I encourage you to go to carbonadvantage.us. It's where we keep all of our carbon advantage work. It is my favorite line of study. We will continue to populate it. And the United States is a very clean economy. In some sectors, we are the absolute cleanest in making things like um, computer products, uh, optical products, the United States is absolutely the cleanest. Um, but we do know that a carbon fee as instituted overseas has been really effective in some economies at reducing emissions uh, where it exists. And we also know um, that a carbon fee can work here at home. So we have models of carbon fees at the state level and at the regional level in the United States. Um, and while the fees have been low so far, they've, um, they've helped uh, limit emissions growth and in some cases reduce emissions um, oh, right here at home. So we know they work. So we are just about out of time. Um, Katrina, I'm just curious what you feel, how optimistic are you that the carbon tax stays in this large infrastructure package? Yeah, we'll, we'll see. Um, 
I was at an event earlier today as part of National Clean Energy Week with a Democratic representative who's in energy and commerce and on the budget committee and the joint economic committee. So you can look at committee alignment um, and see if you can figure out who I'm speaking of, who said he doesn't know what's in the reconciliation package. Um, it seems like the Democrats are working feverishly on figuring out what their priorities are to include and how much money they can spend. So we really don't know what's on the table now. At the Climate Leadership Council, we're gonna keep advocating for our four pillar approach move these policies together uh, as one. I'm sorry, uh, a question just came in through chat. If you could mention that website once again. Carbonadvantage.us. You can also go to clcouncil.org and you'll, you'll find it through there. Matt, Katrina, thank you so much. And this has been a really exciting discussion about tax, which people almost never say, but it's, uh, it's the pot potential for this to do good is, is really incredible. So thank you so much for sharing that message with us. Thanks, Claire. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Katrina. Thanks, Claire. And old technology is playing a significant role in the future of food. So in this next somewhat lighthearted segment, I'm going to talk with Cordon Bleu trained chef Katie Quinn about her recent book, which I actually have a copy of it here, Cheese, Bread and Wine. It's about some of the world's favorite and oldest fermented foods. Um, Katie is based right now in Southern Italy. So I filmed this interview earlier um, about a week ago. So I'm going to share it with you now. I'd ask you to stick around because at seven o'clock we have Dr. Catherine Hayhoe who will be joining us in conversation with Dr. Mercedes Quesada Embiid. And again, we're going to be talking with them and give you the opportunity to ask questions and we're gonna change how we ask questions. And Dr. Hayhoe will explain that to you at seven o'clock when they join us. So right now, just stay tuned and we're going to look at fermentation. And who is coming to us from the Puglia region of southern Italy. And I have just finished her book, Cheese, Wine, and Bread, which was a lovely book. And in addition to really, I would say for the first time in a long time, making me want to get on an airplane and go eat some British cheese. Um, it also made me think, man, I really need to up my cheese game. And I'm like super, we were like a lot of people in the pandemic making bread early on and then we sort of abandoned it. But now I'm like, I'm gonna do that sourdough starter 
and we're going to start making bread. Katie, welcome. And thank you for writing <laughs> such a lovely book. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm stoked to be here. Um, you, this is such a wonderful program and I'm really honored to be a part of it. So how is it came about that you are part of a program on really on the environment and the sustainability is fermentation because it's estimated that there's going to be 10 billion people perhaps on the planet by 2050. And they think one of the keys to feeding people will be using fermentation for things like plant-based protein. But your take on protein really is a throwback to this is an ancient source. So I think there's just this incredible symmetry between this ancient source of creating and preserving food to solving one of our really intractable, intractable problems of the 21st century. Yeah, I completely agree. I'm so glad that, that you see this too, because you know, whenever I, I read about things or hear about things about alternative proteins and these technologies, um, a part of me is like, why are we calling this like an alternative protein? Mm -hmm. Like, why is this an alternative thing when the technology of fermentation is the oldest, one of the oldest ways of making food that we, that we have? And so it's like, we're talking about fermentation technologies as though it's this like super new thing that was developed in a lab somewhere. And it's like, uh, if you, rewind 2000 years ago and go to China, they were loving on the tofu already. So like, it, it's interesting to me. I think that fermentation and the way that I look at it and the, the, the research that, that I did for my book, when I was diving into these things really just showed me it, yes, is as present today as it ever was, but it is essentially the same thing. It's transforming a food through microbes, right? This is like the simplest, oldest thing. Um, and, and it's preservation at the end of the day that is delicious, just happens to be delicious. Well, I'm gonna hold up the book again because it's a lovely book. It is part nonfiction, part cookbook, part travelogue. I will also say one of the great things about this book is that you've introduced us to people, characters, but real human beings, um, Antonia, the Comelli family. And it was so nice to meet these people. And so I wanna just take a step back and ask, how did this book come about? How, why did you write this book? Well, first of all, thank you. Thank you for your kind words. That means a lot. Um, so it came about because, okay, Cheese, wine, and bread are three of my favorite things, and I'm probably not the only one. I'm guessing maybe some people out there watching this are like, oh yeah, cheese, wine, and bread. So those are some of my favorite things too. And, and it was when I realized, oh, these three, these three things are fermented because fermentation has become a bit of like, I don't know, some people might think immediately of like hipsters and kombucha, you know, Brooklyn <laughs> or like some new like trendy um, kimchi company or something. And yes, those things exist. But, but like we were just talking about before, this is one of the most um, ancient and essential ways of, 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 of humans thriving with food. So when I realized, oh, cheese, wine and bread, these are all fermented. I bet a lot of people don't think of that. Maybe with wine, because I feel like wine and beer. But I was like, oh, there's something here because these things, this is the trifecta. For me, this is the trifecta of fermentation. Um, and I was living in London at the time and um, was, was cheesemongering at, uh, are you familiar with the word cheesemonger? <laughs> Some people well, might not be. But. Yeah, but I mean, this monger, you know, because you there are fishmongers as well. So is this an ancient British term or English term? I think that it may have English origins, actually. Um, but yeah, it's it's basically um, a person who is an expert 
in mm. cheese. And the person, when you go to the cheese shop, who knows everything about this cheese? They know, they know the farmer who raised the cows, the guy with the milk. They know all, all of the elements, what kind of rennet was used, which by the way, because this is an environmentally focused program, you know, there are a few different ways to make cheese to, uh, to coagulate the milk into curds and whey to then make the cheese. Um, animal rennet is um, kind of like the, the oldest way and that's using the, the stomach lining of a ruminant yeah. animal, like a calf. But more and more increasingly, um, cheeses are being made with vegetarian rennet. So, um, you know, if we're talking about alternative proteins, um, non, animal based proteins cheese cheese is is an example of that as well because more and more i i think i read something like 80% of cheeses in america are now being made with vegetarian rennet um anyway where was i going with that claire um but basically the cheesemongers are people who know everything about a cheese that you're going to taste and they're enthusiastic about cheese. And um, I put on my wellies and my cheesemonger hat and I learned everything there was to learn about cheese in England, which has such an incredible history. I mean, cheddar comes from a town called Cheddar in Southern England, which, you know, before I started researching this book, I had no idea. Well, one of the things I also loved about the book was the, the photography that was in the book. And so I do recall the picture of you in your wellies, uh, in your teeth, <laughs> longer uh, uniform, um, as well as with, you know, up to your elbows in, you know, milk curds or, or whatever that was. But yeah. I will also say one of the things that struck me as I was reading the book is, you know, wait a second, when you think about cheese, wine and bread, it's just a few ingredients. I mean, it's not, you know, a page long of ingredients. And yet the human ingenuity that goes into these three items that are made in such a multitude of ways, doesn't that blow your mind? It blows my mind. Yeah, yeah it's incredible. Don't you just want to like time travel and be with, you know, the first probably tribes who, who determined, oh, like, I'm traveling with this milk, right? There are nomads traveling from land to land and, oh, I'm traveling with this milk. And, and after time, of course, now we know lactic acid, back, naturally occurring lactic acid bacteria was present and would make a fresh curd type of thing. And they were like, oh, if I can just like, what if I do this a little longer? Yeah, I want to rewind and, and be with people as they first determined this is delicious. If I do this with grapes, this is awesome. If I do this with milk and, and grains. Yeah. So I'm also, you know, really, when I think about human ingenuity, but ingenuity plus artistry, you know, cuisine has got to be one of those, those pinnacles of human achievement. If you think about what people have been able to do with something that's essentially utilitarian, right? We need to, we need this to live but oh, we can make it beautiful and we can make it taste in many amazing different ways. Um, I want you to mention or, or just address the fact that fermentation takes time. And, mm. and we live in a time where people are used to kind of living on like permanent fast forward. So does fermentation have a place in a world where we're living so fast? Absolutely, because we're still human, right? And there have been so many studies done about how this fast, crazy pace that we do is, is not very healthy for us, right? So we need something to balance that, something to balance this like live tweeting culture that we all live in. And for me, fermentation is that antidote. I mean, when, when I get up every morning and I feed my sourdough starter, it, you know, these, these things become routine and they, they make me slow down, right? So I can't go immediately to my email because I can't be on email while I'm feeding my starter, right? So I, I think it, it's one of the few things that actually makes us slow down in a really important way. And 
it's just like, you can't rush fermentation. Time is the unspoken ingredient in all of the, these things that I read about, cheese, wine, and bread. We can talk about um, you know, the grains, we can talk about the grapes, we can talk about the milk, but, but the ingredient that is the same in all of those that is so key is time, just like you said. And I, I think that hand in hand with that, and you had mentioned this earlier, is the simplicity involved. And so humans have found a way actually to speed up fermentation in some ways. And we see, we see that it's not always the best thing. Like bre a lot of breads that, that some people like think of as bread, the grocery store shelf bread. If you look at the ingredients list, there is a ton of additives. And also mm -hmm. what might not even be on that ingredients list is additives included in the flour, right? So the flour, when it's milled, all these things are added. And these additives are with the purpose of expediting the fermentation process, making the yeast um, you know, grow extra active, extra quickly. And you know what? We can taste the difference. We can feel the difference in our bodies, there have been so many studies done, and I, I do talk about it in the book, but, but it's a whole wormhole um, that I didn't entirely go into, but there have been so many studies shown that sourdough, you know, breads made fermented with sourdough versus an, a yeast additive um, is, it, our bodies digest it better. And a part of that is that fermentation actually pre-digests foods for our bodies. So many, in many cases, not always, but in many cases, people who um, think that they have a, a gluten allergy, it really, it, it's not all breads. Um, it's not all breads. And fermentation is really a huge part of that. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, so fermentation, yes, absolutely has a place in today's world. In fact, I think it might be more important than ever to, to really hang on to it. You know, that just reminded me of something, and I think maybe I'm getting a little philosophical here, but, um, I love it. You, Bring it. <laughs> this has been a year of sort of disconnect where people had to sort of isolate but maybe I didn't quite understand this, but there was a part in your book where you're talking about bread dough and sourdoughs, and you were talking about the microbes on the baker's hands and in the bread. Like, like there's a part of this person that's in my loaf of bread. Am I like, is that too far off left field? No, no, it's, it's true. It's, it's absolutely true. Um, so there's a there's a Korean word for this, which I'm blanking on at the top of my head, but but there's a word for this. And it has to do with like, so when you make kimchi, right? Your hands, the, like a mother's hands is like massaging yes, the absolutely. cabbage and all the other things. Yeah. And so there's a Korean word for literally mother's hands kimchi. And it's the same, it's the same idea of what you're saying because bakers um actually that so what's really okay so i'm gonna get specific here but it goes to show that it's kind of a symbiotic relationship here between the person making the food and the food itself because so this korean word that i'm blanking on that i just mentioned is talking about how the kimchi itself changes based on the the microbes healthy microbes, might I add, just for mm. anyone who's healthy microbes from, you know, cleaned hands still have healthy microbes on them. Um, so the kimchi is affected by mother's hands making it, for example, but the other way around as well. There's a study written about in the New York Times that, um, that sour, the sourdough bakers, not that the bread is, not that they impart some of themselves to the bread, but that the bread imparts itself to the bakers so that the baker's hands contain um, traces of their work, of their life's work. And that is uh, the microbes in sourdough. 
So there's a line in your book that I wanted to just ask you about, and that's the, the phrase eating with integrity. So how does one eat with integrity? You know where your food comes from. Mm. You, you know, you, you, you understand the system in which it has arrived on your table, on your plate, um, and eventually in your mouth. And eating with integrity takes into account that other humans and animals that are involved in whatever, whatever you're consuming. So eating with integrity is the acceptance and acknowledgement of the larger system at play um, and, and making decisions based on that. So before we started our webinar, we were discussing offline a little bit about our ancestry. And I'm just wondering in the course of thinking about these older, slower foods, did, you, did it make you think any differently about your ancestors? Yes, hugely, hugely. In fact, you know, I didn't mention this when we were chatting ab about this before the chat, but so I'm living in Italy now, right? In Southern Italy. Um, the, the reason that I moved here essentially is because while I was researching for my book, visiting vineyards um, to learn more about wine in all around Italy, but also in Southern Italy, I found my great grandfather's birth certificate while I was researching for the book. And that, that is when not only was I, was I like, oh my gosh, my great grandfather is from here in this land. And, you know, I was just on a vineyard and um, you know, tasting the wine made from these grapes and everything was just swirling in, in my mind. Like how was he doing things and how would he have made wine um, in these fields? Because his family, they were a farming family. They were all agricultural. Um, and then that, that of course led to, um, to me moving here and, uh, and pursuing citizenship. So it's all thanks to my fascination with fermentation actually that, that I'm living in Italy now. Katie, I can't believe it. We're just about out of time. And I just wanted to remind the audience of your wonderful book, Cheese, Wine, and Bread. Um, I should also mention that it seems to me that there's quite a bit of your personality in this book as well. There's <laughs> some lovely illustrations, and I can't wait to see what you come up with next. It's been lovely chatting with you. Thank you so much for your time this evening. And I wish you the best of luck in Italy. Thank you so much, Claire. It was a pleasure. Thank you for your fantastic questions. Thank you. Welcome back everyone. And thank you for joining us this evening. We are now entering our final segment and she has been called one of the nation's most effective communicators on climate change by the New York Times. Dr. Catherine Hayhoe has found that the most important thing we can do to address climate change is to talk about it. And she wants to teach you how. Her book, Saving Us, was just released this week, two days ago. And tonight she joins us along with Dr. Mercedes Quesada Embiid to discuss how we move forward as individuals and a country to affect positive change. Dr. Mercedes Quesada Embiid is an Associate Professor of Environmental Policy and Advocacy at the Department of Environment and Sustainability, Catawba College in North Carolina. She's an interdisciplinary scholar with research and teaching interests spanning the social and natural sciences, as well as the humanities. Her interests gravitate toward and explore an array of eco-egalitarian concerns, in particular, the role of socio-ecological resilience as it relates to local and global sustainability efforts. Dr. Catherine Hayhoe is the chief scientist at the Nature Conservancy. She's an accomplished atmospheric scientist who studies climate change and why it matters to us here and now. She's also a remarkable communicator who has received the National Center for Science Education's Friend of the Planet Award, the American Geophysical Union's Climate Communication Prize, the Sierra Club's Distinguished Service Award, and she's been named to numerous lists, including Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People, Foreign Policy's 100 Leading Thinkers, 
Fortune Magazine's World's Greatest Leaders and the United Nations Champion of the Earth in Science and Innovation. Welcome to both Dr. Mercedes Quesada Embiid and Dr. Hayho. And I know Dr. Hayho would like to explain how you're going to submit questions this evening to her. And it's going to be a little bit different, so we're going to ask you not to use the Q&A here, but she's going to explain how she wants you to submit questions. Good evening, Dr. Hayho. Hi, it's great to be with you here today, even virtually. So we wanted to do something kind of fun. We are going to be talking with each other. Uh, Mercedes has some questions prepared and then we're gonna be taking your questions. But I wanted to take them via poll everywhere because you can enter your questions, you can see everybody else's and you can easily upvote the ones you most want us to get to. So before we get there, we're gonna do a little bit of practice, okay? I know you're like, oh, here goes the professor, but I promise you it's fun. So to join the discussion, I put the link in the chat. It's also right here. You go to p-o-l-l-e-v dot com slash Catherine. If you're typing it out, you have to make sure to spell Catherine right. It's got two A's in it, like Catherine Hepburn. If you want, you can just click on the link in the chat. It's right there too. You don't have to enter your name. Just push skip. Anonymous is fine. And to make sure you're still here and you were paying attention earlier tonight, I have a question for you. What do you think now, after what you've heard in this forum about seaweed and or beavers? And if you don't know why I'm asking that, you have to go back and watch the recording because there were some amazing presentations about seaweed and about beavers that featured something like air, bee, and beaver. That was my favorite line. So you can enter any word you want. And the reason why you have to enter one word is because as you can see, it's a wordle. So, People are just getting the hang of this. That's what this is for. It's for practice. You just click on that link, polyv.com slash Catherine, and you enter whatever word you want. And I completely agree with these words. I don't know if you're talking about beavers or seaweed, but I think both of them are pretty good. They're brilliant. They're awesome. They're saviors, and we love them. Okay, so this is the way it works. And stay tuned because at the end, before we go to your questions, Oh, awesome. Yes, absolutely. And hopeful too. At the end, I'm going to ask you another question. So you're going to have to give me another word after we're done. And then you're going to be able to put your questions in here yourself. And you can see all the other questions that people put in. You can upvote the ones that you most want us to answer. I love how this is shaping up though. So the more people put in the word, the bigger the word. So we've got hopeful and awesome, which they totally are. And we've got brilliant, amazing, positive, and intriguing. Yes, you can tell why scientists study things because we are so intrigued. So this is the way it works. Put it aside for now, just keep it open and we will come back to that at the end. Mercedes, take it away. Hey everybody. It's so, so nice to be back in the throes of the Vail Symposium. So I really do appreciate uh, the invitation to be back in. I feel reconnected with you all. Even though it is virtual, I still feel as if I'm seeing all these familiar names on the participant list and imagining your faces um, and really excited to be a part of this group again. So very honored, not only to be here with the renowned Dr. And Ka Dr. Catherine Hayhoe, but uh, with all of you as well. So really excited. We don't have a lot of time together, so we're gonna get started. Um, but we're gonna be a little ambitious with our time. We've got a lot to cover. So we wanna sort of uh, do our part to give you guys a sense of what this session is gonna be about, which is science communication, hope and agency. How do those things work together? How do they meld together? And so, you know, we, we want to really take advantage of Catherine's wisdom and her experience. Not only is she bringing awareness to the world about climate changes and a lot of the complexity that's involved in needing to make some adjustments to our lives in order to adapt the way we're expecting the earth to adapt, but um, change making that's good for all of us. Right, so her book, which we're gonna be discussing tonight, um, as Claire mentioned, is right here, Saving Us. And we're very excited to be able to really tap in again to her wisdom and internalize some of the goodness that she's gonna be sharing with us. So I wanna start us off with a question that seems an obvious starting point, but uh, engages our curiosity nonetheless. You know, when I looked at this book, when I received it from Claire, um, really thankful to have the advanced copy and be able to make my way through these passages and these pages that really very impressive, good work here. Um, I wondered, and you may get this question a lot, but why this particular title? Why saving us? 
That is a great question. And it's because so often we hear people telling us to save the planet as if the planet is somehow separate from us. But the reality is, is the planet will continue to orbit the sun long after we're gone. It is us living things who are at risk from the fastest climate change that we have seen in the history of human civilization, a change that's happening 10 to 50 times faster than between the last glacial maximum and now. So whether it's polar bears, whether it's humans, whether it's trees, or whether it's seaweed, we all living things are the ones who are at risk. It's not the planet itself. So that's why I called the book Saving Us. Well, you know, I want to follow up that excellent response and sort of very practical response, right? It, <laughs> it has a lot of truth and merit to it. I want to let people know what your subtitle is, because I think that's also really valuable to the conversation. And it's a climate scientist case for hope and healing in a divided world. You know, we felt a lot of those divisions of late. You know, we felt division socially. There's a lot of social dissidents. There's a lot of strife, whether that's political strife or economic strife. And could you just kind of contextualize for us what you mean when you say divided world? Well, we live today in a United States that is more politically polarized than it's been in pretty much any of our lifetimes. Today, as I talk about in the book, people who adhere to one party and vote for one party, they see people who vote for the other party more as enemies than fellow citizens. People focus much more, and you just go to your social media feed and you can see this, on what divides us rather than what unites us. So our world is divided among humans. We are the ones who are dividing ourselves from each other, cutting ourselves into smaller and smaller groups based on what we think about this and that and whatever. Whereas in reality, we are all living here on this planet. We all breathe its air. We all drink its water. We all get our food from this planet. Everything we have and use comes from this planet. And we all, when it all comes down to it, we all want the same things. We want a safe place to live. We want you know, good food to eat and water to come out of the tap when we turn it on. We want our kids to have a future. We want a world that is abundant, a world where nature thrives, a world that is better than the one we have today, not worse. And although some people might not prioritize those and some people might not understand how fixing climate change is what's required to get those things, when it all comes down to, if you just had a survey and you said, do you want a better future? Do you want your kids to have a safe life? Do you want to have a safe place to live? I mean, nine, 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 nine out of what, 10,000, 100,000 people would say, of course I do. Why are you even asking that? Well, that's exactly what climate change threatens. And so that's why to care about climate change, we only have to be one thing. And that is literally a human being living on planet earth. But if we don't come together on this, we're never going to be able to fix it. And so that's why tackling that divided world that we live on head on is the first step to solving it. Oh, thanks so much. Really. I mean, uh, it sounds so easy when you describe it like that, right? <laughs> it, and it really is easy, right? There are choices that we make all the time, yes. choices of how we're going to engage with each other. Those are choices. You're and, right. and we can make the right ones. We can make better choices. So I appreciate that the simplicity that you come to this very complex issue with, because sometimes our answers are far simpler than, than we give them credit for. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I want to kind of stick with this idea of the book for a moment further, um, because you have a wealth of experiences. You've done sort of steady kind of on the ground research you've participated in symposiums and you've gone and presented at conferences and your research has really made its way out into the world. Mm -hmm. And many other researchers take the work that you've done and, uh, and expand upon it. And so I wonder, you know, there are many books out there on climate change. There are books, you know, whether it's Suzuki or Klein or Martinez Elier or whomever the authors may be, there are many scholars writing and talking about this. And, you know, they cover the social aspects, perhaps. They cover some of the ecological economic aspects, perhaps. Why did you choose to write a book? What was it about writing a book that sort of made the difference for you? Well, I didn't set out to write a book because I'm not one of those people who can just write a book easily. It took so much blood, sweat, and tears. I literally wrote, I think probably the equivalent of three full books and I threw out two of them <laughs> on the way to this book. But I wrote it because I was absolutely determined to answer the number one question that anybody has asked me anywhere. And I've already been asked this question once today. And I've been getting this every single day for years. What 
gives you hope? That is the question I'm being asked. And I don't think that there's a short answer to that or a simple answer to that. So that's why I wrote the book. And so it looks like it's like cl on climate change on the surface and it's written by a climate scientist. But when you go a little bit further, you realize it's more about us. It's about how we relate to each other. It's about our sense of who we are in the world. It's about where does our sense of hope come from? What does the future look like in such uncertain times? And it's about how each of us has a role to play in taking us towards that better future. It is not a guarantee of a positive outcome. That's not what hope is. In fact, it's really interesting because just to give you a little bit of what I found, whether you begin with theology or philosophy or psychology, hope begins in a dark place. It doesn't begin with positive circumstances or a guarantee of a positive outcome or positive thinking. It begins by recognizing, by having the courage to look the situation in the face and say, it's bad. It's very bad. In fact, as scientists, we know it's probably worse than we even think because it's an unprecedented experiment that we're conducting with the only planet we have. But we still know, and the IPCC report was very clear on this. We know that our future is in our hands. We know that some impacts are here today, but we know that the most dangerous impacts have not yet been written in stone. We have the ability to act. And so as Catherine Wilkinson says, who of course is one of the, co the editors of All We Can Save, an amazing book of 60 different women voices on climate change. She said something and I ended the book with this quote. I ended the last chapter with this quote because I thought it was just so powerful. She said, and let me make sure I get this right. She said, it's a magnificent thing to be alive at a moment that matters so much. Ultimately, our sense of hope depends on our sense of efficacy. Do I think I can make a difference? Do I think we can make a difference together? Our sense of efficacy is absolutely abysmal. We feel completely disenfranchised, completely powerless. Like I could do everything I could and it wouldn't make a difference. Well, I'm gonna be honest. We could all, all of us who are alarmed and concerned about climate change, which are more than half of the country, we could all change our light bulbs. We could all do everything we could to get solar panels or an EV if we could afford it and not everybody can. We could all go um, on a plant-based diet. We could all stop flying. And you know how much of the US emissions we would cut if we all did everything we could, literally? Less than 20%. That's because it's a system-wide problem, you know? 90 companies are responsible for two thirds of heat trap and gas emissions since the dawn of the industrial era. 20 companies are responsible for a third of the problems since 1950 or 1960, 20 companies. And so then we might feel even more helpless. Like, okay, I've done everything I can. And you know, I have the solar panels and the electric car and we've changed our diet and I changed how we travel. What have you done? You've done lots of things too, I know. Oh, you're asking for real? Yeah, yeah, yeah. you. <laughs> I've also got, you know, um, a commitment to, to organic practices, uh, mm -hmm. whether it's by way of diet or by way of clothing, um, really prioritizing those things. Yeah, they, they do take a little bit more from the pocket by the way that we do our perverse subsidies in this yes. country, right? And they do sort of take away other things that I might have chosen to spend um, funding on. But instead, you know, the EV car and those lifestyle choices do sort of uh, encompass then and allow us at least to um, match our values to our practice a little exactly. bit more. Exactly. We sort of reside in hypocrisy simply because of the system, as you mentioned, but there's a little bit of this ability, little tiny steps mm -hmm. where we can create a little bit of alignment or a sense of alignment. And that is exactly what starts to feed our sense of efficacy. So the biggest impact of us taking action ourselves, which you do, which I do, which probably most of the people on this call do, is it changes us. And then, and here's the most important thing we can do about it. We can talk about it. Because if we talk about it, it changes other people. How will people know how important it is to buy organic or to look for sustainably sourced products? How will people know where you got your solar panels or the fact that you're considering driving instead of flying for your family vacation and why? How will they know if we don't talk about it? And then here's where it gets really crazy. And you'll have to buy the book to get the whole thing here, but this is really amazing. I have to tell you the best part. If we look at how the world has changed before and the world has changed before, so 200 years ago, it was acceptable to own another human being. 150 years ago, it was acceptable to tell a woman that she shouldn't be educated or vote because it might overheat her fragile little brain. 
you know, 70 years ago, people couldn't enter a building because they, their skin was a certain color. I mean, the world has changed in profound ways. And that's just in the US. We can look at apartheid in South Africa. We can look at slavery in the UK too. The world has changed in profound ways. And it was not because a president or a CEO or a king or a rich person or a powerful person decided it should. It was because the average ordinary people of the world decided that the world could and should be different. And you know what they did? They certainly did everything they could. But if they had just done what they could and nothing else, the world would not have changed. They did one more thing. And that one more thing was they used their voice to advocate for change, to inspire others with the need to change, to group together into larger groups of people to talk to elected officials at the city level. Cities are very powerful at the state level, to talk to people who run their company or organization, to talk to the school, to talk to their place of worship, to talk to their neighborhood. They got together to talk and to advocate for change. And you know what? That tipped over the first domino in the long chain that led to a different world. They did it back then. And if they did it back then, why can't we do it now? Oh, that's an excellent perspective to be sharing with us. And, you know, I, I wanna sit with that idea of talking and communicating because oftentimes we think about, you know, communication and collaboration as being one in the same, but they're actually quite distinct. Mm -hmm. right? You're not necessarily communicating well simply because you're around other people. And so how is it that with something that feels so politicized, right? And something that feels so heavy and so close yet so far away, like climate change does, right? It sort of um, has a, a, a strange impact on us and a strange mm -hmm. influence on our psychology and our, our, our thinking about the world. How is it that you do talk about it? What are some strategies that you would suggest you know, that you've used in the book and that you would say would be helpful for us with that one uncle or aunt who's challenging yes. us on this or a professor that's, you know, just not understanding why I wrote the essay that I did or my neighbor or my coworker, you know, how do we really kind of navigate those waters of doing the talking that needs to be done? That is exactly the question. And you know what? That's the second most frequent question I'm asked. And that is also why I wrote the book. <laughs> so the book answers the two burning questions. What gives you hope? And okay, if action is what gives us hope, because hope does not come first, we act and then we find hope through talking with others, through connecting with others. How do we actually do that? How do we connect with other people? Well, to explain how to do it, I want to introduce you to something called the six Americas of global warming. And Mercedes, you might've already seen this before and a few other people might've seen this before too, but it's a really important perspective to understand who people are and where they're at. So because I get to share my screen, I'm going to, let's see, there we go. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with you so you can see what I'm talking about. Here we are. This is something called the Six Americas of Global Warming. Now, normally on climate change, we often think that we can divide people into two groups and those two groups are literally us and them. We sometimes put labels on those two groups, like believers and deniers. And I don't like either of those labels. And I explain why in the book. It's because often people who are cautious, right in the middle, 19%, they tend to lead with their doubts because they have questions. And frankly, what person wouldn't have questions if you listen to the way climate change is talked about in the news media today? It is normal to have questions. And it is quite normal, unfortunately, to have doubts because people are deliberately trying to see them in your mind. So cautious people often lead with their doubts. And if they're immediately just slapped with a denier label, it just shuts them up and they remain cautious. They might even move into doubtful because nobody likes to be shamed. I don't like the word believer either because that implies that it's a religion. And frankly, people use that. Senator Ted Cruz from Texas, where I live, actually uses that frame. He says, oh, climate change isn't a science, it's a religion, deliberately so that people of faith who make up the large proportion of people in this country, Catholic and Protestant, so people of faith will say, oh, it's a green religion. Well, I already have a religion. I don't need a new one. I'll reject it too. Thank you for warning me about that. So rather than believers and deniers, I think this description really works well. We have people who are alarmed and people who are concerned. And you know what? That's 55% of the country. 55% is alarmed or concerned. Then we've got people who are cautious. You fold them in. We've got almost three quarters of the country in those categories. So in those categories, people are already worried. I know because I talk to them all the time. They're already worried. 
but they don't know, understand it properly. They don't know what to do about it. And so they just feel helpless. So with people who are alarmed or cautious or concerned, you don't have to dump a bunch of fear on them. You have to say, hey, let's talk about what we can do. Let's talk about what other people are doing. Let me tell you a really amazing story that I heard about what the city of Vail is doing or what the state of Colorado is doing. Did you know and have a statistic? I have the statistics for Texas at my fingers, but not Colorado. Did you know that Texas gets 23% of its energy from wind and solar? That's amazing. Did you know that per megawatt of installed energy in Texas, there's eight times more jobs if it comes from wind or solar than from natural gas? That's great. Did you know during that crazy Texas freeze when everybody lost power for days or even weeks, wind energy overproduced? It made up for some of the shortfall that left us in the hole with natural gas. And did you know that we're making changes? The city of Dallas is powered by clean energy. Houston is meeting its Paris target. Change is happening. And did I tell you about how much I love my solar panels and how happy I was that I didn't have to go to the gas station during COVID because I could just plug my car into the wall? And also I've changed my shopping habits because I learned that food waste was a big part of the problem. So now instead of going grocery shopping once every two weeks and loading up a whole extra freezer, I got rid of the freezer. I put in drying racks for my clothes and I go grocery shopping twice a week and we get a lot more fresh veggies and fish that way. And so we've been able to make our diet better, more healthy, more affordable, reducing food waste and more plants and fish and a lot less other meat. And that's great. And I love it. And we're so happy. You see, we can talk about everything at every scale because those people need to be engaged. They feel helpless. They don't feel like there's anything they can do. And hey, I'm going to a great meeting of Citizens Climate Lobby tonight. Do you want to come along with me? Or I heard this climate scientist talk. I read her book. You want to read it too? It's actually not depressing. I promise you. <laughs> I'm, I'm literally talking about my book. It's, it's not depressing. <laughs> I promise. <laughs> So then we've got disengaged. They're the people who've been living in a cave literally the last 10 years, and they're a very small percent of the population. Then we've got doubtful. Doubtful people are people who are really, really strongly identify with their politics. Their identity comes from their politics. So it's going to be really hard for them to hear something that doesn't fit with what their political leaders and the pundits they listen to are saying. And then at the end, and let me go back to the doubtful because there is a way in and I actually have data showing it, but let's get in with dismissives. 8% are dismissive and they are the people who are obsessed with the fact that climate change is a hoax. They talk about it all the time. They post about it on social media all the time. They will argue with you till the cows come home. And you know what? There is no secret to a positive conversation with a dismissive. I honestly think an angel of God with brand new tablets of stone that say global warming is real and foot high letters of flame would not change their minds. So why would I? You can't. And believe me, I've tried a few thousand times. So this is actually based on scientific data too. <laughs> but with people who are doubtful, people who are disengaged, people who are cautious, we absolutely can engage them by beginning the conversation with something that we agree on rather than something we disagree on. Like what? Well, you might agree on having a healthy local economy or the fact that you both like to save money. You're both parents. You both go to the same type of church. You both enjoy hunting or fishing or skiing. You need snow for skiing. So we made a series of videos um, and we had um, a two-time Republican Congressman, Bob Inglis, who you may know. We had a retired army general, General Ron Keyes, speaking from a military perspective. We had the head of a libertarian organization, the Scannon Institute, speaking from a libertarian perspective. So Republican, free market, army, libertarian. And then they had me speaking from a Christian perspective. We made a series of four short videos and they aired them on social media in some purple districts where they had Republicans and Democrats. They just aired them in social media. They just kind of threw them out there. And then they tracked, they kept their thumb on the pulse, so to speak. They tracked Republicans' opinions on climate as these videos got thrown out on social media. Mm. They didn't know who was watching them. They didn't ask people, did you see it? They just tracked average Republican opinion as these videos aired again and again on social media. And guess what happened? It changed Republicans' opinions about climate change because oh, you had an army God. general, a free market advocate, a libertarian, a Christian talking to them about climate change. It worked. So in my book, I do talk about how 
one scientist came up to me and said, I've been trying to work with churches in my local area because I've seen you do that and I see how effective it is, but I just can't get my foot in the door. What would you recommend? So I said, well, I recommend starting with the church that you have the most in common with. So, you know, what's, what's your own tradition or your own history? He said, oh, I'm an atheist. So I said, stop. This is not the right place for you to be talking to people. And don't worry, there will be someone else. We don't have to carry this load all ourselves. We're all together. I said, what do you like doing? What do you enjoy? Who are you? What, what are you passionate about? He said, science. Because of course, that's what we will always say if we're a scientist. <laughs> and I said, <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> but what else? And he didn't quite know. So I said, okay, do you hike? Are you a member of the Rotary Club? Do you, are you part of a community group? Do you volunteer with kids? Do you coach soccer? No, 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 no. But finally, it was like a little light went off. He's like, well, I dive. I was like, oh, you dive. That's great. He's like, oh, well, yes. In fact, I have, I have some records for some very deep dives. I'm very serious about diving. I do a lot of diving. I'm like, that's perfect. Somebody needs to be telling divers that the ocean is absorbing over 90% of the heat that's being trapped inside the climate system by this blanket of heat trapping gases we're wrapping around it. Somebody needs to tell divers that they can see things changing before their eyes. They can see species moving. They can see coral bleaching happening. They can actually participate in citizen science projects where they tag incidents of um, stony coral tissue loss, for example, in the Caribbean. S divers need someone like you to talk to them about why climate change matters. And if you are a diver, then you already care about climate change, even though you don't know it. So that's just an example. Who you are is different than anybody else. You have things that you care about, that you know about, that you're knowledgeable about, that you're passionate about. You have tables that you sit at, metaphorically speaking, that other people don't. And the most important thing you can do is to use your voice at every single one of those tables to talk about why climate change matters and how we can take action to help fix it. Oh, awesome. I love those examples. And I think that they're, um, they're very attainable, right? I mean, in the book, you talk about you know, true hope, and you talk about reasonable hope, and you talk about this actionable hope. And I think that the examples that you've just shared really do um, give us the, the sense of satisfaction that, that we can do that, that we can actually achieve this sense of sameness. You know, we can kind of pull away all these filters, pull away everything um, and, and, and get there, really reach, reach and connect with folks mm -hmm. about the things that truly matter. I mean, these are the issues of our time. They really are. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm managing to, to get us steps closer, right? I always think about how, you know, when we think about our divided world, we have all these walls up, mm -hmm. right? And how if we knock down those walls, they become bridges, you know, and then there we are, right? Entering into each other and having that uh, more reciprocal relationship with one another that where we will learn in the process as well. Of course we will. Um, I got one more question before maybe we think about opening up to the audience because I know I'm sure there are tons of questions. Um, there are some of, good ones <laughs> uh, being uh, being being brought forward. I've so I just got one more. You know, we we I think there's a difficulty sometimes for folks to make this leap that climate change is an intersectional issue. That climate change really has much to do with social justice issues. And it has much to do with um, sort of economic integrity issues in a way different than perhaps our capitalist system um, identifies for us. And so I wonder if you might be able to speak to that a little bit and why we have a tendency to politicize human rights. Why, why do we have a tendency to do that, you think? And then we sort of play down that importance of social justice and its role in climate change and, and, and building this better world. We feel that human rights is a zero sum game where someone else can only move up if we move down. And the reality is we move up or we move down together. So again, rather than focusing on what divides us, we have to focus on what we have in common. And with climate change, I'm gonna say something kind of provocative. I'm a climate scientist. And I don't think climate change needs to be on our priority lists at all. Why is that? Well, so often we feel like, okay, well, I, you're a climate scientist, so it's probably number one for you, maybe number two. But you know, it's number 12 for me because I have these other urgent things above it. Yeah, of course, like you have, might have health issues, you're worried about your family, you know. 
And so we sort of feel guilty, like we have to sort of move climate change up the list, but then you've got, you've got Black Lives Matter, you've got gender equity. And like, where do those fit with climate change? Which one's on top? I'm gonna free you up. Take climate change off that list. Take it off entirely. Put it right over here. Why? Think about what is at the top of your list that you care about. So I'm gonna tell you mine. I'm gonna ask Mercedes to tell you hers. And then I'm gonna ask you what, what to give me just one. We're gonna cheat, we're gonna have several things. So what's at the top of my priorities? What do I care most about? I don't know that I can give it to you in order, but I will definitely say, first of all, as a mom, the fact that I have a child, you know, when that child is born, something happens to your heart. It just changes you forever and you would do anything for them to ensure their future. I care very much about my family and people I love. I care about the place where I live. I care about the place I grew up where all my family has lived for generations in Canada. I care very much about the fact that the poorest and most marginalized people are being disproportionately affected by climate change, whether it's black and brown neighborhoods right here in Texas where I live, or whether it's poor farmers in India on the other side of the world. They're the ones who are suffering most. I care because, um, because I love snow. I'm Canadian. I love doing things outdoors and we need our snow. And I also care because I'm a Christian. And I believe that we humans, all of us have responsibility to care for every aspect of this amazing planet that we've been given because we have the ability to do that. And we have the ability to care for plants, for animals, and for our sisters and our brothers too, many of whom are not as fortunate as we are. So that's sort of my list of why I care because I am a scientist, yes. I am also a mom, I'm a Canadian, I live in Texas, I'm a skier and I'm a Christian. Why do you care, Mercedes? <laughs> You took all my answers. I'll just say ditto. That's fine. I'm teasing. I'm teasing. <laughs> students always say in class, that's what I was going to say. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, really, I think that we do have a lot in common. And with regard to your responses, I care about interspecies justice. I care about intergenerational uh, equity. I care about my babies, of course, right? I've got a seven-year-old uh, named Montaña and a, a little one named Rio who just turned one year. Mm -hmm. And I care about them because not only do we often talk about our youth in the country as the future, they are also the present. They are mm -hmm. also here now. And I think we lose sight of that. And I, I really value the youth of our country. I think the youth are incredibly disenfranchised. I think that they are told, you don't get a place at the table, come back when you're 40, you know, then we can talk. You don't have an opinion, yeah. you don't have experience yes. yet. And they're constantly dismissed. Uh -huh. And I think there's something really, really callous about that. And mm -hmm. uh, I think about how the majority of the world is women. The majority mm -hmm. of the world are of our darker shades, right? If we're all on a spectrum of, of, of brown, right? The majority of the world are actually on the darker shades of that spectrum. Mm -hmm. I think about how unfair it is that the number one job globally is that of an agricultural worker, and yet it mm -hmm. is the most important job, we could argue, and yet it is the um, least well-paid, um, highly disrespected profession, uh, mm -hmm. the way in which we put things into practice. Mm -hmm. So I have a lot of those same priorities of really wanting to, to right the wrongs of, of the past by way of our present day actions. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it, I have an appreciation for the fact that our challenges are very complex mm -hmm. and our solutions, as you highlight in this book so eloquently, our solutions need to be equal and match that complexity mm -hmm. in order to be effective, mm -hmm. right? In order for us to be able to move forward. So um, yeah, a little bit of a long list as well, but. <laughs> And, and you're going to have your own a long list too. But what I want to do is I want to give you, before we go to a couple of questions here, I want to give you a chance to give me your word. So if you go back to pollev.com, remember I said I was coming back to you, right? Oh, we got people already there. You're awesome. Go back to pollev.com and give me one word. I care about climate change because I am a, we've got mom and parent and grandparent too. We've got human, yes, absolutely. We humans can't float around in outer space without this planet, we would die. We're alive, yes, we're a humanitarian. We're a member of this race, yes. Whoever we are, and this is a great bottom line to end on, whoever we are, we are already the perfect person to care about climate change. And the chances are, whoever you're talking to, they are too. And if they don't think they are, it is not your job to turn them into you. That doesn't work. 
it is your job to show them, to get to know them and figure out what they care about and show them how who they already are is already the perfect person to care too. And in fact, caring about and acting on climate is a more genuine expression of their values as a mom, as a human, as a family member, as a consumer, as whoever they are, climate action makes them a better parent, a better mom, a better humanitarian, a better human than they were before. Oh, that's great. That's really great. I can't see the um, words coming in, but I imagine perhaps the audience can. I hope so. Uh, yes. So I was sharing my screen. So I think that you were able to see it. Oh, was I not sharing my screen? You were sharing the screen, but it wasn't populating. Oh, dear. You know what? Yeah. Oh, shoot. But you were reading them out. So I was able to follow yes. along. I'm it's sure because it wasn't letting me share the whole screen. Just a second here. That's so annoying. I'm so sorry about that. <laughs> Okay. Um, for some reason, it's just not liking me to share the whole screen. And that is the fault of, you know, Zoom just does weird things sometimes. Once in a while, Zoom just says, to heck with it. I'm done with life. You're just going to get what I give you. And I think that's <laughs> what it unfortunately did right there. So I read you the answers and they look super cool and they were awesome. Um, and now we get to take your questions. And if you go to PolyV, you can see the questions right there on your phone or computer. And we've got lots of great questions with some upvotes. And uh, why don't we go for it? Just pick one and we can go there. Let's and I'm going to go Let's ahead while you're picking the questions and taking a look at them. Claire, I don't know if you want to pick a question. I'm going to go ahead oh, and give, oh. I, I'm going to just say, I can't see those questions. I don't know if I'm in the wrong spot on poll EV. Um, I see that on the side, I see home history registration, but I don't see You go the to pollev.com slash Catherine. Oh, okay. Yeah. The, and the link was in the chat there too, if you just want to click on it. Oh, that would probably be easier. And I'm going to go oh, ahead. There are some good questions here. Yes. Yeah. I'm going to go ahead and put a link in the chat because if you're interested in getting my book, you can get it anywhere books are sold. Your local bookstore, <gasps> book anywhere online. Yeah, exactly. Anywhere online, um, an ebook, an audible. Please buy it. Please spread the word. I would love everybody to be talking about climate change because you know what? Only 14% of us are. Only 14%. But if people buy this book and if they see the book and if you share the book with somebody, you give it to somebody when you're done, people will start talking about climate change and we could change that number. All right. So I'm going to ask that, oh, the sorry, question Claire. that has the most upvotes, if that's all right. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Hayhoe, should we protect children from climate anxiety by avoiding the bad outcome, outcomes to come and that we're already seeing from climate change? Um, if not, how should we talk to them about climate change? Well, they're already going to hear about it. Trust me. If a child is more than just a few years old, I mean, there are wonderful shows actually like Octonauts even and Wild Kratts on PBS. And I think even Dinosaur Train talks about it a bit. Kids shows are already really good at introducing the topic, but having something that kids are doing about it. And that is the key. It's important for us adults. It's even more important for kids. And you know what? Kids are doing amazing things. So I have a little series on YouTube called Global Weirding, and I'll put the link in the chat here, but you can just Google Global Weirding and you'll find it yourself. And our most watched episode is called, I'm Just a Kid, What Can I Do? When you start looking at what kids are doing, it is incredible. They are doing amazing things. And so yes, tell your kids what's happening in a factual way, not making it, you know, it's not like the world is ending, but yes, this is serious. And this is a bad thing that grownups have done but we know better. And here's what someone just your age is doing about it. Here's what someone a bit older than you is doing about it. Here's what somebody's school did about it. Here's what somebody else did it with their whole family. Do something with your kids because to quote Joan Baez, you probably didn't think I was going there tonight. To quote Joan Baez, action is the antidote to despair. So when we tell our kids about this, we have to include something that we can do to make a difference. And they know that that's how we fix the world. So um, we, we are just about out of time, but I want to ask another question that has a number of upvotes. The question is written, truth, reality, facts, even science seems to not be valued today. Making a better future requires working towards some common goals. And we, when humanity has such hugely diverse views of what is true, how can we motivate action when so many of our leaders and voters simply deny the truth? 
Well, we need everybody moving in the same direction, but they don't have to be doing it for the same reasons as we are. That's a big mistake that we make. We think everybody has to care for the same reasons we do. Everybody has to agree with all the facts we do before they're allowed to start moving in the same direction. You know what? I don't even care if somebody agrees that climate change is real. If they want to put wind turbines on their farm, I'm just like, you know what? You're doing more than the person who says it's real and does nothing. So it's about forgiving each other for some of the differences, letting the minor stuff slide and saying, we're focusing, hyper-focusing on what can we agree on? Where can we find common ground? Our, our circles might only overlap a tiny bit, but let's focus all our attention on where we overlap and figure out what we could do together. And they might wanna do it for one reason, you might wanna do it for another, it does not matter. You're moving in the same direction together. So I'm gonna turn it back over to um, Dr. Quesada Embiid to ask the final question. Oh, thanks very much, Claire. I think you selected some good ones and I really appreciate everybody um, thinking and voting and looking at those questions carefully. You could get this at the Edwards Bookworm, right? It's gonna be there for you to purchase. So you can make your way over to that great bookstore that I miss so much. Um, this same energy that you are seeing on this call is the energy that is in the book, right? Uh, Dr. Hayhoe really approaches this with such enthusiasm, not only enthusiasm, but kind of an eagerness, right? And, uh, and an excitement that really challenges us to find that same level of high energy focus and hope for doing the right thing, right? And so I guess, you know, uh, my closing, it's not really a question, rather a, a closing comment, and then I'll invite you to uh, share a closing comment as well, is really just um, an appreciation for your ability to, you know, bring us into this gentle fold of trying to do the next good thing for society, for ourselves, for our families, for the non-human, and really helping us to be reminded that we've got this, larger all-encompassing set of spheres and that statement that you just made a focus on where we overlap right that notion of overlapping really does fit in well with a world that's incredibly globalized with a world that is incredibly connected by way of social media with a world that you know uh, gives us these opportunities to learn and see and engage in ways that just weren't possible before and so I really just appreciate, um, you know, your ability to kind of get us to, to internalize that and really reflect upon it and consider what, what we're going to do tomorrow. What's our, what's our thing we're going to do tomorrow? Maybe yes. tonight. <laughs> what's, that, what's that conversation that we're going to have? And if you're still not totally sure about the whole conversation thing, if you're not sure about why it really matters, or if you're not sure about how you could even do it, don't worry, the book goes there. It really does. <laughs> So my sister read it before I, fin I finished it. And she's like, you need a chapter that just tells people how to do it. And I was like, oh, okay. So she's like, how do you start? What do you say? What do you say next? What if they do this? How do you end? So I was like, all right. So I literally wrote that chapter. So it is there for you. Please use it. Please share it. If you like it, please review it online because that helps more people find it. If you review it on like... Um, Goodreads or on Amazon. A lot of people even go to Amazon, if they, even if they don't buy from a local bookstore, they go there to look at the reviews. So please do that. Please help to spread the word because really this is all about, again, saving us. Well, thanks so much and really appreciate the opportunity to be a part of this with uh, Catherine and with all of you. Thanks so much. Thank you both. What a fabulous discussion and what a really great night and for our audience who stayed with us for this really kind of an experiment for us. This was a little bit outside of what we typically do. We usually have hour-long webinars and tonight's program will be almost three hours and just a wide range of really great topics, uh, a newfound respect on my part for beavers and for seaweed and you know, just feeling a little bit um, galvanized that I can actually go out and talk to people and perhaps have some effect on them. And also, um, this just gave me like a little shot in the arm that, you know, it, it gave me a bit of hope and um, a bit of motivation as well. So thank you all very much for this wonderful program. Again, for our audience at home, thank you for joining us. And I hope you'll join us in person next week. Our program is on Tuesday evening. We welcome uh, Timothy Standring from the Denver Museum of Art. The program is Whistler to Cassatt, and we will be at the Edwards Interfaith Chapel. Good night, everyone, and thank you very much.